Hi, and welcome to the last day of the I3D conference this year. My name is Ari Silvenoinen, and I'll be hosting the first session this morning. The program for today consists of a keynote and two paper sessions before we close the conference and announce the best paper and best poster awards. Right after the closing session, we also have a social event and play some Rocket League. If you want to participate, you need to complete the free registration. And if you don't own the game, you can download Rocket League for free using the link here. Further details are also going to be on the Discord social channel. But OK, we start the day with a keynote from Colin barre Brisbois from Electronic Arts. Colin is the head of technology at SEED and applied research and development group at EA. Prior to working at SEED, Colin worked on the Batman Arkham franchise at WB Games Montreal. And before that, he was also a rendering engineer on several EA Montreal and DICE games, including Battlefield 3, Need for Speed, Medal of Honor. Colin has also presented his work at multiple conferences and contributed to GPU Pro and Ray Tracing Gems book series. And today, Colin will talk about a really hot topic, real-time ray tracing. Um, so in addition to higher-end PC cards, we have the first generation of consoles with some sort of hardware support for ray tracing now available. And Colin will talk about what all this means for real-time game graphics now and in the future. And as a reminder, you can ask questions during the presentation in the Discord keynote channel or on the YouTube. And we will have a live Q&A session after the talk. But now, Colin, please take it away. Good evening to wherever you are in the world. Uh, I hope everyone here is doing great and hope you and your families are safe. Uh, my name is Colin Barry-Brisbois and I'm the head of technology at Seed Electronic Arts. Uh, and in this keynote today, I will chat about the dream that many of us have had for so many years where ray tracing is the future and will ever be. Uh, this time with a focus on video games. Um, I will discuss the state of the art and various challenges we're facing in games with real-time ray tracing. So hopefully my talk will give you a sense of where we are at uh, in the games industry with some of these challenges uh, that we're facing, but also uh, inspire you uh, for your future research in case you want it to make its way uh, into video games and other real-time interactive mediums. Before I begin, I would like to thank Ulf and Ari for inviting me and I would like to thank Peter Pike and Paul for their great keynotes. So here's the agenda for today's talk. So first, I will give a quick overview of Seed's research. Uh, I will then spend a few minutes looking at where we're at uh, today with real-time ray tracing in games. Uh, then I'll talk about the road ahead and what are some of the things to consider when thinking about uh, ray tracing research and making it applicable for games. Uh, finally, I will talk about some of the open problems that remain. Hopefully, this should uh, spawn some ideas uh, in your head that you can bring up during the Q&A uh, right after the talk. So let me tell you a bit about SEED. So SEED stands for Search for Extraordinary Experiences Division. Um, in case you don't know who SEED is, we are a technical and creative uh, research division of Electronic Arts Studios. We were established in 2015, and our team is around uh, 30 people and is distributed uh, across the world in six locations, including Stockholm, Montreal, Los Angeles, uh, Redwood Shores, London, and Vancouver. You can find more info about Seed at seed.ea.com, uh, or you can follow us on Twitter. Um, and at EA, uh, SEED exists as a cross-disciplinary team where we combine art, engineering, uh, creativity and research to deliver uh, d disruptive innovation for our games and our players. So we try to run as fast as possible towards the future uh, and we run in parallel to current business constraints. And this is for the benefit of our games and all of EA Studios. So by focusing on short, medium and long term research, our portfolio gives us uh, an opportunity to do research and always be delivering technology artifacts along the way. Um, we do this in collaboration with game teams, central groups, as well as many external partners in hardware, software, uh, industry standards bodies, and academia. And of course, as an R&D group, we have to present and publish. Uh, and over the years, we've accumulated more than 50 publications and presentations, uh, which you can find on our website. Uh, we also open source some of our work, so uh, you can find it uh, and you can find us on GitHub as well. 
At Seed, our research is split in three vectors, so advanced avatars, deep testing, and future graphics. Uh, I'll give you a quick overview of each vector so that you get a better idea uh, about these topics that we're focused on. So advanced avatars, uh, the first vector I want to bring up, is based around building a revolutionary pipeline for creating emotionally convincing characters. And so at Seed and EA, we are deeply focused on transforming how we do performance capture for our games. Uh, we do this by using machine learning and computer vision to build these artist-friendly assisted workflows that um, enable content creation at scale and quality. So this means that uh, character creation technology for accelerating the work of our art experts so that they can do their best work and iterate as fast as possible uh, to really focus on the art. Our second vector is deep testing and is a direct application of machine learning for improving how we test games. It is uh, you know, well known that games are getting bigger and bigger and that with games running as live service, gamers want more content delivered faster. And this is where machine learning comes in and enables us to improve how we test these games at scale and speed so that we can deliver better content faster and hopefully bug free. So instead of you know taking a brute force approach and just throwing more people at the problem, we use machine learning to build tools that help our testers with um, tedious tasks, which means uh, you know an overall improvement of quality of life for their for them for our developers, uh, where they can actually focus on more important fundamental things. Um, also. You know, with the progress of neural networks learning how to play games by themselves, we can mimic human-like behaviors that really go beyond uh, current automated testing approaches. So for example, like scripted bots where, you know, where the game will actually learn and play like a human. So this means that we can find bugs faster in ways that humans do, you know, before they get out in the wild uh, to millions of players. And finally, our last research vector, future graphics, is built around uh, building novel content creation techniques and breakthrough visuals. You know, real-time ray tracing obviously comes to mind, but also other things like real-time global illumination, uh, realistic physics simulations at a fraction of the cost, uh, and new ways of authoring content. So uh, more, more on this at upcoming conferences. Uh, so here we try to push the boundaries of real-time visuals and simulations, and we try to enable uh, building and playing in worlds that you know we could only dream of before. And the thing is, as programmers, we tend to want to optimize, which means uh, sometimes coming up with approaches that are not always friendly for content creators. So for example, having to build LODs or having to unwrap UVs is one of those uh, tedious tasks that you know that comes to mind. And so in this vector, we explore radical shifts in how we build the content uh, with a focus on making these new approaches artist-friendly and pain-free. We also explore how these techniques can benefit some of the latest hardware, so with, you know, next generation's consoles, well, I guess you could say current generation consoles now, but also future hardware architectures. So now that you know a bit more about Seed and what we do at EA, let's switch gears and talk about uh, real-time ray tracing in games. Looking back, this journey of bringing real-time ray tracing to life has been quite awesome. You know, from the initial announcement of DirectX ray tracing back in 2018, where you know a few of us partnered with Microsoft, NVIDIA uh, to bridge the API, the GPU, and the software, and also some of the great work from our friends at Epic, uh, FutureMark, and Remedy, to uh, hardware acceleration being announced and an initial round of PC blockbusters supporting ray tracing in real time like Battlefield 5. You know, this was a really a really good start to 2018. Then in 2019, people had a bit more time, you know, to play with the API and and it evolved and with all the conversations between Microsoft and the companies listed there and the developers which led to, you know, the spec for DirectX ray tracing to evolve to version 1.1. And then following that in 2020, uh, a new generation of consoles got announced with ray tracing support, which, you know, really helped solidify and reinforce the fact that real-time ray tracing is happening across consumer entertainment platforms. And then in 2020, beyond DirectX, the Vulkan API ray tracing spec got finalized by the committee and the various members from industry and, you know, people that are in this 
in this talk right now. So, so looking back at these four original demos, you know, at Seed we felt very lucky to have been involved early on with Microsoft and Nvidia to see what could be done with this technology. Speaking for ourselves, you know, the hybrid rendering pipeline we built for our Pika Pika demo at the top left uh, really allowed us to create visuals that, you know, are augmented with ray tracing and feature an almost path trace quality at 2.5 uh, samples per pixel. Um, you know, this was really challenging to build, but extremely fun too. And, you know, you can also forget the, the amazing demos from the folks at Epic, NVIDIA, and ILM uh, who built uh, it in the Star Wars universe with uh, film-like features and visuals in Unreal 4. And there was also this really cool demo from our Finnish friends at Remedy, you know, featuring a bunch of ray tracing techniques in their North Light engine, including reflections, ambient occlusion, indirect lighting, and ray trace shadows. Uh, similarly, another great demo from the folks at FutureMark, who always come up with really impressive showcases to push your GPU as far as it can. And as mentioned, you know, DICE's Battlefield 5 was one of the first games that shipped with real-time hybrid ray tracing using the XR uh, powered by EA's Frostbite engine. Uh, you know, it features really awesome uh, ray trace reflections. And now, you know, beyond the initial round of games, a myriad of games followed suit and showcased ray tracing. Uh, I counted 50, not I don't think I couldn't list them all here, but you know, the list keeps growing. And this is really encouraging to see. And it's totally understandable why everyone is excited about what real-time ray tracing can enable. Let's talk a bit about the two most common techniques these games support, starting with reflections, which undeniably add a lot to the image. Um, obviously, one can do perfect mirror reflections, though the more complex case here is to tackle rough and smooth surfaces. This is typically done in a hybrid way for performance reasons by figuring out which pixels on screen can rely on screen space reflections results first. So if the ray coming from the camera uh, into the scene and its reflection end up on screen, like the puddle of water here from Battlefield 5 with the results highlighted in orange, then you can use existing screen information for that reflection. So otherwise you trace the ray uh, in the world and evaluate the BRDF at the hit uh, here in blue, for example. Results are then merged and technically should blend and match, but this all depends on maybe some of the shortcuts you've taken along the way in your BRDF evaluation. Hopefully they fit well together. Uh, as you probably guess, this approach is taken mainly for performance reasons. Uh, other tricks to achieve performance are needed on top of that. So things like variable rate uh, tracing, where you evaluate um, where you should launch more or less rays on the screen, for example. Ray binning, where you launch Reflection rays pre-sorted by direction buckets to help drive the GPU with more predictable intersection workloads and shading workloads for that matter too. Um, you can even sample the shadow maps instead of launching a secondary ray for the reflection shadows. Um, as you can see, like many tricks here and from the image uh, below, this is a glimpse of the whole pipeline that was built to have real-time reflections at performance in Battlefield 5. So please check out the talk from Ioannis and Jan on this topic for even more details on the whole pipeline. And Shadows is another popular real-time ray tracing technique that you could find in all these games, mainly for its simplicity between quotes. Um, here I say between quotes because at its core, uh, it's not too complicated to implement, right? Just launch a ray from the surface towards the light, and if the and if it hits something, then you're in shadow. Uh, alternatively, if it misses, then it means you're not in shadow. And you know, say, oh, well, hard shadows are great, but you know, soft shadows are definitely better at conveying scale and are more representative of what happens in the real world. Though maybe our direction, you know, is fine and wants hard shadows too, with minimal penumbra. Um, so the simple case of a directional sunlight can be implemented by sampling random directions in a cone towards the light and treating it like an area light. But the thing is, the wider the cone angle, the softer the shadows, so the more noise you'll get, and so you'll have to filter and denoise it. Uh, you can launch more than one ray if you want, but you will still, it will still require some filtering. As you probably guessed, the complex case here is area lights, where you need to sample across the area, uh, so here you definitely need denoising, but you'll get really nice, uh, so, like soft shadows, like the images, uh, like the image on the right here from Call of Duty. Really awesome blend of sharp and rough shadows, as you'd expect uh, from real-world lights. 
Now that we've talked about the state of real-time ray tracing in games, I would like to talk about some aspects of the road ahead for real-time ray tracing from the angle of research. So to be more precise, hopefully some items mentioned in these next slides should give you some insight into what we think about as game developers when it comes to ray tracing for our games and, and some of these challenges, right? So, and how this could potentially drive and tailor some of your research in case you know, like I said at the beginning, you want to target games or any other real-time mediums. So one thing about game development ray tracing and film ray tracing is that production ray tracing solutions don't always map one-to-one -to, -one to game ray tracing solutions. Uh, for film, you will find many courses at SIGGRAPH, you know, on production rendering with a focus on path tracing, where we talk about complex shading, handling millions of lights, uh, difficult volume rendering scenarios and you know other things you can think of uh, for film um, you know really difficult use use cases that render in 24 hours render times you know on massive clusters now the thing is in games uh, we have a much more limited set of ray tracing features in order to fit in 33 or 16 milliseconds um, still ways there still ways to go before you know we move to full patch tracing in games uh, like film, but I think we'll get there some way. So the first thing uh, is that most of the work we do is tailored around maximizing the hardware uh, that we have, right? So whether that's on PC or consoles. A common denominator to achieve that performance with these techniques is that they are built on this concept of a hybrid pipeline where different aspects of rendering are solved with the best tool at hand. So for example, you might use rasterization for some of the rendering. You know, rasterization is very good at what it does and GPUs do it very well. So we should definitely use it uh, to its full potential. You know, compute shaders as well, you know, and the programmability, programmability that they unlock, you know, for some of the aspects of the pipeline. Uh, some techniques might also mix and match various stages and, and that's okay. And that's, you know, what's needed to achieve that performance. So this hybrid world I'm talking about here, you know, from the example uh, on this slide, to me is, I, I think it's here to stay at least for the next few years. Now, I think the elephant in the room is that as we go through this transition and add more ray tracing to our games, at its core, ray tracing can diverge to how we currently think of rendering in games. So in games, you know, what you look at is often what is assumed to require processing. But with ray tracing, many systems need to be adapted where uh, everything is expected to be available and provided up front. So rays, you know, can end up anywhere in the scene, right? So, you know, materials need to be known up front and rays can also hit objects that are really far. So you need to handle various levels of detail for geometry and textures. So maybe things you don't typically have loaded and resident in memory have to be. Um, animations is another one that comes to mind of which uh, I'll cover in the next few slides. So the first one that comes to mind is how you handle world state. Um, and as I was saying in games, what you look at is often what is assumed and so you don't render or even load things you don't see, which sounds pretty obvious. But with ray tracing now, you can't really rely on rendering workload reduction uh, mechanisms like frustum culling because rays are launched in world space, meaning they can go behind or outside the frustum or outside the, you know, outside the camera. And just loading everything and updating everything is not really a solution uh, for performance. And it's actually quite prohibitive to constantly update acceleration structures. This means that you need to handle dynamic things like animations and dynamic geometry to the best of your ability, predict what needs updating and cleverly do so to manage that performance. Uh, here's an example where in this game you can notice that some of the characters in the reflection are in uh, what we call t-pose meaning that they are in a default state and are not being animated and their position in the world is right so you know the characters are where they're supposed to be but the animation was not updated so some of the other characters though look like they're walking and in animation so you know it's clearly driven by what is being budgeted per frame for updating animations uh, one can only guess here that some sort of round robin prioritization happened. And you can also notice that some objects are also lower resolution in terms of shading. 
Um, again, most likely for performance reasons of not having everything loaded at highest quality and being able to update every dynamic object, every frame here, you know, for a big chunk of the game world that can be uh, reflected in that window. You know, this is an open world game. And if we talk about numbers, here's what I mean. So when I mentioned that updating a BVH uh, is not free, um, you know, as you know, a BVH is a structure that we use for accelerating ray tracing and ray traversal in the scene. Uh, the latest generation GPUs accelerate this by providing hardware ray triangle and ray box intersection. Um, and this is supported by a two layer structure, so top and bottom. So in Battlefield 5, the example here is 20,000 top level instances and uh, 5,000 bottom level meshes. Uh, a naive update of the whole BVH then is 60 milliseconds. Uh, so instead of updating the whole thing, you know, by cleverly balancing rebuilds and refits, uh, you can bring this down to 1.15 milliseconds per frame while slightly augmenting the cost of your trace. So you can see from the numbers here going from 0.7 to 0.8. You know, this means that the BVH is not perfect every frame, but you're significantly reduce the cost uh, without affecting tracing too much. Uh, streaming is another case that comes to mind that needs to be adjusted for ray tracing. Uh, again, rays can you know, go in any direction, and this well-used concept of uh, positional loading prioritized by camera orientation kind of goes out the window. Um, but ultimately, this means that more resources need to stay resident at high resolution so that visuals and the transitions between the zones are coherent. Um, lights is another one, right? So how to handle lights is, is, is something that comes to mind. So here again, you can't only treat lights that are intersecting or enclosed in the frustum. So how do you choose which lights to sample when a ray hits a surface, any surface? Uh, to solve this, you can use a camera-oriented acceleration structure like what Unity does. Uh, you can also use a horizontal plane with per cell light list like was mentioned in Battlefield. Uh, but another approach is to treat this as an important sampling problem with some really great papers by Moreau and Yuxel, uh, and lately the spatial temporal reservoir resampling paper from NVIDIA and Bitterly that shows how reservoir sampling can accelerate convergence for both biased and unbiased use cases you can see from the images there and handle millions of lights in milliseconds. So this is really promising. Another item here is material graphs. Game engines uh, heavily rely on artist-driven material graphs where a lot of the features assume uh, concepts easily available for rasterization, but not necessarily for ray tracing. So things like procedural geometry, like vertex displacement or instance vertex animation in a, done in a shader, you know, affects the geometry ultimately uh, in the blast. So it will require refits and rebuilds. And a refit and a rebuild is not something, you know, a shader can typically trigger. Uh, transparency, where a mask, for example, is used to clip as another example. And, you know, that concept is much more complex to implement with ray tracing, you know, with any hit shaders, uh, which requires additional shader invocation, which ultimately can affect performance. Or pixel quad derivatives, uh, you know, to choose which MIP level to pick when sampling a texture. There is no pixel quad for ray tracing, and so you'll have to implement something on your own, whether that's ray differentials, ray cones, or the latest paper from Akin and Muller on uh, improved shader and texture level of detail using ray cones. So three years in now into real-time ray tracing, and now that APIs are moving towards being able to launch rays from any shader stage, a trend is to move towards more decoupled ray tracing. Here's a high level example of a generalized pipeline where large out of core ray batches and ray hits are sorted for deferred sharing and shading. Basically grouping work items together that make sense to optimize GPU workloads, occupancy, and overall performance. So basically six stages that can be adapted based on your needs. So the first step in a compute shader is to build a list of rays that you need for uh, ray tracing. Here, because this is general, you can think of launching rays in screen space and texture space or any other parameterization of your choice. You can also do this at any resolution. Then you bin the rays to maximize coherency. Uh, one way to do this is to sort rays in some kind of space that allows you to bucket them by direction. Uh, 
It turns out that octahedral space is perfect for this. Um, but bidding can go beyond directions, like ray types that you know will do similar work, but direction is definitely a common way to do this. Then in a ray gen shader, so for each bin, you launch the rays. This is to manage uh, coherency, again, which is key for performance. So grouping things together that perform similar operations and memory accesses, like uh, primary rays or shadow rays or reflection rays, things like that. Then back to a compute shader where hits are gathered and sorted by material ID, for example. Uh, you don't shade just yet, but instead sort all the unsorted hits into something more organized and regrouped. Um, GPUs like predictable workloads and shading random materials from random rays doesn't really align here. Uh, this is why this stage is really important. And so by batching similar things, the overall GPU occupancy will be uh, later improved. And this next stage uh, is where the hits are shaded. Again, in a computer shader where basically uh, the shader runs based on each hit type to shade. Um, by grouping common work items together, like materials of a certain type, again, you're helping the GPU here. And this is also where you might launch secondary rays for things like reflections or shadows or global illumination, for example. And those would enqueue back into the ray generation stage. Uh, finally, the last stage is where the, the final result is put together. Uh, you might also handle reconstruction at different resolutions. You might uh, reuse results. You might merge uh, you know, results with non-ray tracing uh, effects. And of, of course, the devil's in the details, uh, especially when it comes to reusing and merging results at different rates and different resolutions to reduce var variance. But overall, this should give you a good idea of a general decoupled pipeline for real-time ray tracing in games. Now, for the last section of this talk, let's discuss open problems. So fun things to think about, and maybe you can help solve. So there's a myriad of general real-time ray tracing open problems, whether from the scheduling side, whether that's instruction cache and occupancy and you know data cache coherence or things like just-in-time blast construction. This great paper by uh, Lee on traversal shaders to build the entire acceleration structure when necessary, but also decoupling. So you know, talking about like reusing intermediate results across paths and frames to noise, right? So optimal MIS to reduce variance and the whole thing from end to end, like pre-filtering, sampling and denoising. And so some of these are definitely, you know, worth looking at and still, still uh, important to solve. So here's a more specific open problem. So in this world of hybrid pipelines, we see more and more implementations of custom geometry renders. So the amazing strand-based hair uh, that the Frostbite team has presented and shipped uh, with the eSports FIFA team is a good example of a very optimized compute-based software rasterizer. Um, and with ray tracing now, the software rasterizer has to interface and feed into the ray tracing acceleration structure. So that's a bit of a challenge. Also, recently, Unreal 5's uh, micropolygon geometry render Nanite is bringing super high levels of detail to real time where basically pixel is the new triangle. So this means that constant streaming of geometry detail uh, and in the world of ray tracing, as we saw, it can greatly affect performance and of acceleration structures, right? And so how do we handle these new trends? The next open problem is around challenges of a two-level hierarchy. Let's take the example of a tree blowing in the wind. Um, you can implement this with a two-level hierarchy where in the top level lives all the trees, so the, the forest really, and the bottom is the actual tree, which needs rebuilds over time as it animates in the wind. Uh, this leads to increased pressure of rebuilding the bottom level as the leaves animate, which is expensive and a lot of unique geometry. Alternatively, with a three-level hierarchy here, where you split the forest, the tree, and the branches, and narrow down and reduce how much rebuilds and refits you need. I'm sure you can think of other examples where another level of indirection could really help. And so what's the saying again? Like all problems in computer science can be solved by another level of indirection? Another interesting problem is lenses and mirrors. So because of reflections and refractions, it's now very difficult to predict uh, where a ray will end up in the scene and the impacts on LODs and streaming. So for example, a ray could end up reflecting or refracting into an unpredictable area of the scene. And considering that uh, ray tracing expects 
things to be known up front, this can be an issue. Not necessarily a crash, but more adverse effects like things popping in, especially over a few frames or stuff not being visually uh, coherent. And so users can notice this and this can greatly affect the overall experience. Lastly, mesh shaders and ray tracing. So the concept of mesh shaders is a new exciting concept that simplifies a traditional rendering pipeline with its vertex, tessellation, and geometry shader stages and replaces it with two stages, right? So the task shaders and the mesh shaders. Uh, the challenge here between mesh shaders and ray tracing is the fact that arbitrary data packets or meshlets can expand into an arbitrary set of primitives. And so in the case of building games with both mesh shaders and ray tracing and trying to keep things coherent, a hit shader that arbitrarily hits a meshlet would then have to invoke a task or mesh shader, which means a non-trivial expansion for ray testing uh, compared to the hardware support for Ray Triangle and Ray ABB. It sounds like quite the performance challenge, and so maybe there is a need for such an expansion to dynamically feed into the BVH Builder uh, for performance reasons, so some things to think about here. So in summary, real-time ray tracing adoption in games has significantly moved forward since 2018. You know, for the many games that have adopted ray tracing on PC, but also the games on consoles too. Still, we have many challenges to solve. Uh, but we're in this together, academia and industry, so let's find ways uh, to work on this together. Check the Annex section of this deck for extra slides with uh, some code examples. I would like to thank the following uh, individuals who are part of making this talk happen. And of course, check out our website, c.ea.com, and follow us on Twitter, at c. Here are the references for this talk. Merci. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. That was an excellent talk. I was really interested. So let's get started with the Q&A. Uh, so I have a couple of questions and then there's also questions from the audience. And one thing that's currently happening is that in the hardware space, things are pretty fragmented. For instance, we, the consoles have different uh, ray tracing level support than the high-end PC card in terms of performance and what's done in hardware and what's not. And this, of course, can increase the complexity of a render as you talked about the hybrid model where you choose the best tool for each job. So I was wondering what thoughts do you have in how to manage this, this increased complexity? And, and, and another part is how do you design features that utilize ray tracing that take gameplay restrictions into account? For instance, if you have reflections that could give a competitive advantage uh, for shooters, if some platforms have that reflection of uh, enemy and some platforms doesn't. Yeah, no, that's a very good question. So I think, um, you know, going back to what I was, uh, what I was saying, um, you know, we're going to see like the minimal set of ray tracing features come in into games, right? So people are going to implement shadows, people are going to implement AO. And to your point, like if a feature enables uh, or makes it so that some people could even cheat right with their i was thinking it's funny you mentioned this because we brought up the example of like you know first person shooter where you have a knife and you use the knife around the corner of the building to see if someone's coming from the reflection you know that's not really awesome because then it gives a competitive advantage um and so so to me it's you know it's going to be the common denominator i think uh you know the 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 game consoles uh, the hardware is there for several years, right? So as time moves on, people are going to figure out ways to maximize that hardware. The same, you know, even outside ray tracing, right? Like if you think about the first generation of games that come out when a generation uh, comes out, like you can see the visual difference, right? People figure out how to use the hardware best. And I think overall, the same thing is going to happen here with ray tracing, where people are going to implement the basics, learn how to maximize the hardware, uh, you know, in partnerships with with uh, with the different console manufacturers, and over time, like it's we're just going to build on top of the stack, and the stack is going to get, and the features are going to get better. So, um, but yes, if you do have features that uh, create certain uh, uh, challenges with uh, competitive aspects of your game, you know that could definitely be that could definitely be a problem. So I would assume that for the more competitive games 
the common denominator would be the the, the baseline. Makes sense. Other thing I've been thinking about lately is that there's a trend of uh, worlds getting bigger. You have the you have Battlefield that Battlefield that has large worlds. You got Fortnite, Call of Duty, Warzone. How do you think? Uh, how do you solve the scalability problem when the world sizes tend to just keep growing bigger and bigger? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think that's an excellent question and. You know, solving scalability, scalability is, I mean, it's an engineering problem, but it's also an, an art and design problem for your game. And, you know, I'm trying to give you the best answer, uh, you know, because all of it is really tied to how you, you know, it's the tech with the art, right? And some of my best work has always been working directly hand in hand with artists. And whenever you can have that conversation with people you say like, this is what the hardware does. Um, and, and you can bridge that, bridge that gap with, with the artists and really work with them on figuring out like, Hey, you know, if we're going to have LODs, this is how we're going to build them. And, you know, if you expose those problems to the content creators, I think they can, they can really, you know, help solve that with you now for specific solutions. I think, um, you know, I think there's a lot of good research being done in the space of uh, uh, continuous like uh, geometry representations where people are moving away from having to build LODs manually and there's just like a, a you know a continuous representation for that geometry. Um, but yeah, like scale is you know forever it's 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 a huge it's a huge challenge for ray tracing and it's something that's you know people are going to keep working on also you know tied back to your previous question around um you know features and whatnot like the fact that you know consoles have a, a limited amount of memory a limited amount of performance you know you can't upgrade the hardware you can't just like swap the gpu you know or add ram um and so i think all of it is tied together uh, in a way, and it, it's going to move slowly. And yeah, I guess that's my best. Answer. I don't have a solution. I wish I could just like, hey, here's a solution. Let's just implement it. So, but no. Excellent. Thank you for the thoughts. Uh, there's a lot of questions from the audience, so I'm going to start bringing those up. Um, Mauricio asks, so what about path tracing being some time away for games, but there are already games like Minecraft RTX that use it full time. Yeah, I think that's a. I think that's very good that this is being brought up because, and and in true honesty, I haven't played um, much of Minecraft, uh, let alone Minecraft RTX. But looking at some of the screenshots online, it's really impressive what um, very, I, I don't want to say simple, but but you know, simplified geometry compared to some of the super high detailed, uh, you know, meshes and environments we get in games. You know, I think the Minecraft setup is perfect for trying all of these techniques and bringing it to life you know some of the gi you can get in minecraft with the just adds so much and makes everything more um uh, coherent um but um yeah i think overall like you know there are games that definitely tailored for for where the setup is definitely tailored for 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 that sort of for for you know more path tracing um and you know hopefully more and more games go towards that I hope that answers the question. All right, and then we have a Navonil Makerji asks about um, sorting rays for coherency, and he and specifically, are you performing wavefront breadth first ray tracing? Yeah, so I guess um, if I understand the question correctly, uh, we've been exploring like you know the balance between like. The mega kernel or the wave front and you know i think originally the the approach that is i guess suggested by the dxr 1.0 is to go for more of the mega kernel and you know talking about the 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 the, the, the decoupled ray tracing pipeline that i briefly talked about um you know definitely elements of being at more wave front but i think ultimately uh it's about figuring out what can you do what can you pack together that so you get the most performance and you need to be flexible there so yeah i guess that's uh, somewhere in between i would say is the is the short answer All right, thank you
Simon Fenny uh, asks, the, the caustics graphics imagination uh, ray tracing hardware did the sorting in hardware. And would you foresee having engines that avoided the additional sorting for that type of uh, hardware? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I haven't played much with the, the caustics, uh, the imagination ray tracing hardware. So I don't know exactly how well it would sort stuff for you, but um, I would totally see um, it beneficial in many use cases to have hardware handle that for you. Now, the reason why you know many of the game developers like to go with um, more manual controlled approaches because we, you know with video game consoles we're used to compared to say the PC world with video game consoles you have a much like deeper access to the metal and really you can control everything and maybe that's why my answer is towards that way uh, but I could totally see like a hardware support you know if hardware can do it why not. And then we have Stephen Hill asking about transparency. Uh, can you speak about the challenges uh, with handling transparency? For example, when you want to denoise multiple layers. Yeah, I mean, transparency is uh, is is definitely an open problem, like Steve mentions. Um, I, you know, there's I think there's a lot of good work with you know some of the papers that have been coming out you know the bitterly paper uh, with nvidia on um um reservoir uh, resampling and maybe there are things that could be adopted there and um but you know transparency is definitely a, a top problem uh, the multiple layers it's the it's a tracking problem right it's like a infinite plane problem so um i wish i had a solution for that Okay, we leave that as an open problem as well. And then um, Pierre Moreau um, asks us about what, what are the performance issues with uh, when you have a lot of different materials, even when you use a decoupled approach? Is this an issue or is it not uh, an issue anymore? Mm, I think, I think, you know, like uh, one of my slides, you know, showing that materials in games are built around these shader graphs and some of them can be very complex and some of them can be very simple i think it's good that moving towards pbr like we've kind of simplified uh, i guess you could say a unified part of the part of the problem um but i would say that uh depending on the kind of game you're building and depending on the kind of you know performance characteristics for a game like are you targeting like 120 hertz are you targeting 240 hertz are you targeting 60 or even 30 hertz uh, there's a lot of latitude in what artists uh, are allowed to do and you know the closer you go to to 30 hertz obviously uh, the more you can have uh, you know really really crazy and detailed and awesome materials but i would say that i think it is it is quite the challenge even a, in a decoupled approach i would say uh, and do you do any LODing for the materials? Say, if you do diffuse multiple diffuse bounces or uh, global illumination bounces, do you simplify the material model? I would say, yeah, it's good that you that you mentioned that. I think one approach right now is to say, uh, use part of the graph or use a subsection of a or use a, a different version of that material simplified, say for the reflections or stuff like that. So you don't have to have the most complicated version because sometimes in a rough reflection, you might not see, you know, the perfect speculi light from the second level detail normal and stuff like that, but you might. So it depends on your case. Yeah, makes sense. And then we have uh, Gabriel Pratico asking about. Uh, what about real-time ray tracing for VR? Do you think it could become viable uh, anytime soon? And uh, yeah, there are there are opportunities to optimize eye tracking, foveation, and, and sort of. But in general, what do you think of uh, ray tracing and VR and the viability of that combination? Mm, that's a very good question. Um, I don't have that much experience with VR, but you know, to me, maybe in the context of VR, 
And you know, this is totally up open for debate. For me, I see VR and ray tracing as you know, that bridge with the primary visibility that you get from the lenses, like, you know, because of ray tracing, you can do primary visibility rays. Um, as for, does it be, sh could it become viable soon? My understanding is you need really high frame rates, uh, you know, for preventing things like motion sickness and whatnot. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a very good question. Um, I wish I you know, I had more experience with VR, but unfortunately I don't. So I don't want to say things that, you know, are not representative, so. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, there's also a question from uh, Flavio Coutinho. Um, the question is, in which ways do you think hardware can evolve to accelerate ray tracing besides, you know, having the hardware intersection uh, with Stevens for uh, ray triangle and ray ARDB? Yeah, I think, um... You know, you could think, well, I mean, I'm not a hardware designer, you know, so I don't know the complexities of, say, implementing additional things like, uh, you know, like fat beams, like for doing like beam type tracing, or I don't know what it would mean to, say, implement things like splines or, uh, but, you know, I think as people figure out the current hardware and the limitations, ideas will will come up and, and, and um you know, I, I'm not a hardware designer, but I would totally see use cases for things like, you know, wanting to accelerate things like cone tracing or like I was saying, uh, beam tracing. Thanks, so. um, Yeah, so I think we are running a bit out of time, but I do have a couple of more questions, more of an open-ended one. So with things like path tracing and, and there are interesting neural rendering approaches coming uh, coming from the research community that kind of challenged the idea of a traditional rasterization-based graphics pipeline. So I was wondering, what are your thoughts in, uh, on all of this business? And do you think that rasterization-based pipelines are still mainstream in, say, 10, 15 years from now? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. Um, and, you know, this is interesting because it means now, like, Typical graphics programmers are are exploring machine learning, which is which is very nice, uh, you know, to bridge those those two worlds. Um, I believe Peter Pike mentioned also something like this in his keynote, where, you know, it is yet to be seen if the performance of like you know real time inference for the the workloads that we expect and that performance for for real time uh, you know graphics, whether you're in the 60 hertz, 120 hertz, you know, 240 hertz world. Um, you know, how far are we from achieving that performance in real time for that, you know, neural rendering uh, and ray tracing and all of these new new things all combined together. So I guess it, it is definitely an open problem, uh, but I know a lot of people are looking at this and I find this very exciting. And I guess tied into this question, I have one last question here and that's, um... Do you have any advice for young people that are entering the field right now? For instance, what things should, should they learn about and what things should they focus on in addition to traditional graphics topics? You mean like for video games or? Yeah. Um, you know, I think, you know, when I started in video games, there was not a lot of resources online. So I'm a bit jealous of, you know, people starting now in the games industry. Um, I would definitely, seek like some of the engines that are available for you to download, whether that's like, uh, you, you know, you could subscribe to, to Unreal, you can sub subscribe to Unity. There's a bunch of other engines like Godot engine and, uh, you know, scavenge as much as you can, learn as much as you can from GitHub. It's an incredible uh, place. Um, and, you know, I, I, I would even say, like, go back to the basics. Like, there's a lot of books that were written about game development, um, you know, game programming gems, I'm thinking of, like, some of the older books. I think these are great. I would even go back in time, you know, for the graphics books as well, just to go back to the roots. And, and I think that's a great way to learn. So I hope that answers the question. I think that's uh, some really great advice right there. Uh, once again, I wanted to thank you, Colin, for uh, for the great keynote and you know lively QA discussions. And um, I think uh, it would be great if we can continue the discussion on the Discord channel. 
for the time being. And, and with that, let's wrap this session and take a little break before our first paper session this morning. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, session five of I3D 2021. Um, really excited about our session today. It's uh, about style transfer, points, and image based rendering. Uh, so, here to present their work, I guess, in video form, um, we have um, Andres Texler, who's going to talk about a split instant real time example based style transfer to facial videos. Uh, we have uh, Tomas Lankuler, who's going to talk about hybrid image-based rendering for free view synthesis. Um, we have uh, Yi Hong Dong, who's going to talk about efficient algorithms for rotation averaging problems. Uh, we have, um, let's see, Sukasa Fukusato, who's going to talk about interactive meshing of user-defined point sets. And uh, we have Sylvain Brousseau, who will talk about unorganized unit vectors set quantization. So, yeah, let's watch the video and, you know, learn more about these topics. Hi everyone, thanks for watching our presentation. My name is Aneta Texler and I'm excited to talk about our paper FaceBullet Instant Real-Time Example-Based Style Transfer to Facial Videos. This project was created at CTU in Prague in collaboration with SNAP and I thank all my co-authors. Imagine we have a style exemplar image of a human portrait and a target facial video. We want to paint this sequence in the given style. But how to do it efficiently? Several approaches dealing with this task were published recently. One of them is Fisher et al.'s non-parametric guided texture synthesis that secures semantically meaningful style transfer, perfectly preserves subject's identity and the visual richness of the style exemplar. However, the preparation of such guidance is computationally very expensive. Also, the style transfer algorithm itself is very slow due to its optimization nature. Hence, it is not possible to obtain stylized video in real time. In 2019, Fuchik et al. presented a learning-based style transfer algorithm capable to reproduce the output of Fisher et al.'s patch-based method in high quality and in real time. However, there are several drawbacks. For each new style, there are time-consuming steps in dataset preparation and training the network, which takes several days. Moreover, the inference requires a powerful desktop GPU, so real-time performance cannot be achieved on CPU or a mobile device. In contrast to mentioned methods, recently released Secura et al.'s example-based style transfer algorithm can deliver high-quality high results even on a single-core CPU. This algorithm uses normal maps as a guidance to copy chunks of the style exemplar to the target image in real-time. However, to preserve subject's identity during the face stylization, guidance needs to be provided, which is costly to compute, and thus the advantage of fast tablet algorithm is unreachable. Our aim is to design a system that delivers results with the same visual quality as mentioned methods, but without expensive uh, computation. To achieve this, we propose to approximate the slow guidance channel preparation of Fisher et al. and extend the efficient algorithm of Sikora et al. to perform the style transfer. In the Fisher et al.'s approach, four guiding channels are used to dry the synthesis and their computation takes tens of seconds on a desktop. 
we reduce this guidance to positional and appearance guides that are essential for semantically meaningful style transfer and identity preservation. We also propose how to change the computation of these two channels to be possible to generate them on the fly and achieve real-time style transfer. The positional guide is a crucial component for ensuring the semantically meaningful style transfer, which means that chunks from the style exemplar are transferred to corresponding locations in the target image. Obtaining the positional guide for the style exemplar is straightforward. All pixels are simply set to a color determined by their coordinates. To create target's positional guide, we detect facial landmarks in style exemplar as well as in the target frame using the method of Kazemi et al. Based on these sets of points, we compute a warping field between the source and target face using the moving least squares method of Schaeffer et al. This warped gradient is the desired target's positional guide. Note that the blue points and the white mesh are shown only for illustration purposes. As mentioned, a key role of the appearance guide is to preserve the identity of the target subject. We found that costly operations of the Fisher et al. method can be approximated by a computation of only a single Laplacian pyramid level. In the first step, the original images are converted into grayscale domain and filtered using Gaussian blur. To simulate the result of Laplacian of Gaussian filter, we subtract the blurred images from their originals. The appearance guide of the style is finished, and the histogram of the target's appearance guide is then matched to the styles one, which is a very important step. The last step in the preparation of guiding channels is a phase segmentation. We propose to take the advantage of landmarks that we already detected in the previous step. First, we connect jaw points, show as the red curve, then we connect left and right uppermost jaw points using an ellipse, shown as the green curve. This very quickly delivers the segmentation of the lower face. To include segmentation of the forehead, we sample color components along the green curve and use the fast color thresholding operation and the connected component analysis to determine the boundary between skin and hair. Here is how the segmentation mask looks like. Once the guiding channels are computed, the stylization algorithm aims to transfer as large as possible coherent chunks of a texture from the style to the target frame. First, we pick a location in the target image around which the chunk will be found. This seed pixel consists of red, green and grey components. For the efficient style transfer, we need to be able to instantly find the closest seed pixel in styles guiding channels. Hence, we propose to use a 3D lookup table that maps all possible combinations of red, green and grey intensities to the coordinates of the closest seed pixels in the style guidance. Note this lookup structure as well as the styles guiding channels are pre-computed. Based on the error metric computed on guiding channels, all pixels around the seed that fall below the defined threshold create a chunk. See the blue shape for illustration. Finally, we copy the chunk from the style to the target frame and repeat this process until the output image is covered completely. Note that all chunks can be efficiently found in parallel. Refer to our paper and Sikora et al's algorithm for details. This whole process is applied on each frame of the input video. 
Here are the results of our algorithm that allows to instantly transfer an artistic style from a painting to a target video stream in real time while preserving target's identity and textural details of the style. It works on various styles and it does not have to be a painting. It can be, for the instance, a photo of a bronze sculpture. Here we demonstrate the importance of individual guiding channels. On the left we show the result without the positional guide where the missing information causes that chunks are not transferred from corresponding locations. Without the appearance guide, the stylization is semantically meaningful, but the identity of target subject is not preserved at all. The result with our full guidance is shown on the right. To test the quality of our approximation of appearance guide, we plug the complex appearance guide of Fisher et al. into our pipeline. The result is on the right. We also generated the result with no appearance guide, which is shown on the left. The middle result with our appearance guide is significantly better than the left result and reaches the quality of the right result. We also tested the influence of the histogram matching on the quality of identity preservation. The difference is significant. See the left result, where the histogram of the target's appearance guide is not matched to the histogram of the style's appearance guide. And on the right, uh, see the result where the histograms are matched. We can transit between identity and style preservation by controlling the threshold during the computing of individual chunks. In case we set the threshold to zero, all chunks are forced to be just one pixel, which underlines the identity, but the result loses all the high frequency details of the style. By increasing the threshold, we interpolate from small chunks to larger ones. This emphasizes the style's details, but suppresses the target's identity. Here is the comparison of our results and methods of Fisher et al. and Fuchik et al. Overall, our method delivers comparable results and presents a good approximation when computational budget is low and real-time inference is required. To mimic a look of living painting, or in this case a statue, we propose the following hybrid extension. We subdivide the statue into a set of separate layers, torso, face, beard and hair. To preserve the identity, the facial layer is animated using our approach. To animate other layers, we use moving least squares deformation driven by a set of control points, shown as yellow dots, that are derived from the detective landmarks. All layers are then blended in the predefined depth order to create a final composition. Finally, here is a live demo running on a mobile phone. To demonstrate the practicality of our technique, we implemented a prototype mobile application. Here, you pick a painting and the style transfer begins. To keep things really simple and the app portable across multiple platforms and devices, this particular implementation doesn't use GPU. Moreover, all computations are happening on a single CPU core. If you are curious, follow the link below. We released the GitHub repository so you can try it yourself. Thank you for your attention. Hello and welcome to my talk. I am Siddhant Prakash and today I am going to present our work on hybrid image-based rendering for Freeview Synthesis. This project was performed with Thomas Limequiller, Simon Rodriguez and Dr. George Dratakis at India Sophia Antipolis and University Côte d'Azur, France. In today's different world of lockdowns and virtual conferences, remote telepresence is the need of the hour. 
Applications such as virtual tools and street view navigation can help us alleviate our problems to an extent. We can now target these applications using free viewpoint image based rendering methods. For any free view image based rendering method, we take a set of casually captured images with wide baselines and sparse capture as input. This is shown in the debug view in the middle. Here, we see the input images calibrated as cameras in green using standard structure for motion. Optionally, we also take a geometric proxy obtained using multi-view stereo methods such as the blue mesh shown in the debug view. The output is high quality novel views with view extrapolation far away from input views. The novel view camera is seen in red moving through the scene in the debug view. To really immerse the users in the environment, we also need interactive rendering rates. Despite recent advances, current algorithms still have some problems. First, blending white baseline captured images tend to introduce color seams in rendered novel views due to mismatch in camera settings. Use of multi-view stereo reconstructed meshes introduce noisy and ill-reconstructed geometry that compromise rendering quality. While recent methods provide superior quality, they come at a high rendering cost as can be seen from the frame rates of these methods. For example, textured mesh is fast but comes with a lot of geometric reconstruction errors. While recent methods are, good, are of good quality but are at very high cost. Our solution addresses, addresses all these issues. First, in a pre-processing step, we perform color harmonization which removes color seams while preserving view-dependent effects necessary for image-based rendering applications. Second, we introduce a novel purview mesh based rendering algorithm which tries to minimize reconstruction errors. Lastly, we propose a hybrid rendering algorithm motivated by per-pixel uncertainty to balance the speed and quality of rendering novel views. Our image-based rendering pipeline consists of a pre-processing step and a rendering step. In the pre-processing step, we take the input images calibrated with call map and a global mesh textured with reality capture photogrammetry solution to generate a harmonized set of images and per input view meshes. Together, they are used to perform novel view rendering in the rendering step. In this talk, I'll focus on our three contributions in terms of color harmonization, per view mesh rendering, and hybrid rendering. Let us review some previous works, first for color harmonization, and then look into some image-based rendering algorithms. Blending input images finds application in problems such as panoramic image stretching, but they work under assumptions violated by our wide baseline datasets. Some color transfer works can also be used to harmonize colors in images by detecting and harmonizing local regions within images. Again, these methods fail for our wide baseline datasets due to insufficient overlap between distant images given the wide baselines that we target. Multi-view mesh texturing works come closest to our use case. While they provide good solutions, they work under Lambertian scene assumptions. Thus, they do not preserve the view-dependent effects required for image-based rendering algorithms. Our solution takes advantage of such diffuse mesh textures and adds on to it by preserving view-dependent regions. Visualizing scene from a set of input images is another well-studied problem in computer vision and graphics. A textured mesh obtained by performing structure for motion, multi-view stereo, and texturing using input images is the most straightforward way to visualize the scene. Using images along with a geometric proxy, early methods such as the unstructured Lumigraph rendering algorithm compute blend weights for each input image to warp and blend them into novel view. Image-based rendering is a well-studied problem spanning the last few decades. Recent methods such as Inside Out improved errors in global geometry by using per-view geometry to get rid of erroneous reconstructions. And now, neural rendering is being used to aid heuristic-based renderings or learn novel scene representations altogether. Deep blending, for example, learns blend weights to blend four candidate input mosaics created by Inside Out-like heuristic rendering. If we plot the landscape of IBR algorithms in terms of performance versus the subjective quality of renderings, we will come, with, come up with a chart like this. On the x-axis, we have the rendering speed in milliseconds, and on the y-axis, we have subjective rendering quality. Textured mesh is fast, but lacks view-dependent effects. 
unstructured lumigraph rendering and inside out are performant with inside out correcting many of the artifacts we see in unstructured lumigraph. Neural rendering methods of deep blending and free view synthesis goes one step further than inside out but at the cost of performance. Ideally, we would like a new image based rendering algorithm to be placed somewhere around here. Any gain in performance at a quality better or on par with deep blending is desirable. Let us now look into each of the three contributions individually starting with color harmonization. Generally, in wide baseline datasets, we have appearance mismatch between images which leads to image harmonization artifacts during rendering. These mismatch is caused by change in appearance of the scene either due to natural causes such as change in environmental illumination or artificial changes such as change in exposure, white balance of the camera or blocking of light source by the photographer. For example, here there is a huge intensity variation on the same regions of the chimney. Here we show how these color seams adversely affect the rendering quality. On the left, we have the per view mesh blending algorithm used in deep blending paper to generate the input mosaics to the network. We refer to it as PVMH from now onwards. Deep blending try to, tries to learn blend weights such that they minimize such mean seam artifacts with some success. But still, residual artifacts remain as can be seen from the color discontinuity in these regions. To completely remove such artifacts, we propose a solution in two steps. First, each image is harmonized using texture mesh as a baseline. In a second step, we reintroduce V-dependent effects from original images. To do so, we identify local regions exhibiting highlights by computing a V-dependent mask as shown on the bottom left and performing Poisson blending to avoid seams on region boundary. The effect of our harmonization can be demonstrated in just these four images out of our datasets of over 200 images. As you will notice, the overall tone and exposure of the images are more even after harmonization. We also preserve highlights which can be seen on the metallic fireplace protection and handle of the cupboards. The effect is striking when rendered with an IBR algorithm. On the left, we have deep blending without color harmonization and on the right with color harmonization. Please notice the stability in color variation achieved due to harmonization. We also get rid of the discontinuities of seam artifacts. Next, we discuss our novel purview mesh based rendering algorithm. To rectify geometric reconstruction errors, a local mesh is generated for each input view. First, the depth map obtained either during capture or through a multi-view studio system is fused with the image to obtain per-view Delaunay mesh. Next, the Delaunay mesh are voxelized and stored in a tiled data structure. For more details on the pre-processing step, we refer to Headman et al. 2016 Scalable Inside-Out Image-Based Rendering. Per-view meshes are better where details in global geometry are missing, such as thin structures. In Inside Out, the depth map was an input to the system, while in follow-up work of deep blending, ConMap MultiView Studio depth maps were refined with a Delaunay mesh obtained using Reality Capture to obtain better quality purview meshes. We use similar data structures and storage method for purview meshes as well. Purview meshes does a great job of reconstructing hard geometric features. For example, the thin structures in the support of this chair is completely unreconstructed in the global mesh. Using purview mesh, we can correct such geometric errors such as can be seen on the right. But if we do not have depth information for unseen regions in the input views, over reconstruction such as on the edge of the chair in left image is unavoidable. Deep blending tries to solve this problem by learning the blend weights to give low weightage to such erroneous triangles of the purview meshes. Thus, if we can come up with a way to learn the blend weights such that they give, we give a low weightage to such erroneous geometry, we may be able to get rid of such artifacts while maintaining sharp textures which is lost in deep blending. Our assumption is that we can find these blend weights without learning and we hypothesize it, it isn't too hard. Our purview mesh based rendering solution is motivated by the assumption that most rasterized styles of the purview mesh has correct depth and we need to eliminate the outliers. Thus, we propose a two-level solution for our purview mesh rendering. In the first step, we select top 12 input tiles, similarly as done for previous methods, and cluster the depth per pixel into two clusters, corresponding to either the foreground or the background. 
Next, we introduce a spatial filter to keep depth in uncertain regions locally consistent. The final color is obtained by blending the color per cluster modulated by the weights obtained via this filter. We refer the paper for technical details. Using our two-level purview mesh blending algorithm, we are able to get rid of very hard and erroneous over-reconstruction as can be seen from these comparisons. Here, the top row corresponds to a novel view from our library dataset and the bottom row corresponds to a novel view from the Dr. Johnson dataset. Finally, we discuss our hybrid rendering algorithm to balance speed with quality of rendering. We studied different artifacts encountered in previous image-based rendering algorithm. As a result, we found out that texture mess, although being highly erroneous in specular and glossy regions, provide very high quality textures in diffuse regions which is blurred in blending-based approaches. On the other end, Purview mesh-based rendering solutions works best to rectify geometric errors in most regions as expected. While the unstructured lumigraph algorithm introduces a lot of ghosting and blurring artifacts, they still do a great job of preserving view-dependent effects, especially in gloss glossy regions. And in terms of performance, there is a clear hierarchy with textured mesh being the fastest and purview, mesh solu purview solutions being slower followed by neural rendering. Thus, we render each pixel using either the textured mesh, unstructured lumigraph, or our purview mesh-based rendering to balance the speed and quality. The decision for which algorithm to use for rendering a given novel view pixel is taken based on the geometric and photometric uncertainty of the pixel. Concretely, geometric uncertainty is the measure of how certain we are of the depth of the given novel view pixel. If the depth is uncertain, we render the given pixel with purview mesh. If we are certain of the depth, we use the global mesh and consider the photometric uncertainty of the pixel to select texture mesh or unstructured lumigraph algorithm. Using the above uncertainty criteria, we compute a per pixel algorithm selection mask. As we can see, a significant part of the scene can be rendered using the textured mesh providing the much needed speed bump. This is observed across all our datasets. Our algorithm is also able to correctly identify geometrically uncertain regions on occlusion edges. Our contributions complement previous works in image-based rendering to gain on speed and or quality. Now, I'll show a few results obtained by our method while we point towards our project webpage, which comes with additional results, including extensive ablation studies, quantitative analysis with a discussion on need of perceptual metrics for IBR, code, and data sets used for the paper. In terms of rendering quality, our method is on a par with deep blending. Especially, our color harmonization provides the final piece to remove unwanted seam artifacts. Compared to other neural rendering methods of NERF and free view synthesis, we provide stable, high-quality view synthesis at much faster rates. While the crude provided by the authors of NERF gave a low-resolution output, we upsample the results using bilinear upsampling to match our target resolution. For all comparisons, we use the code provided by the authors. Please see supplementals for details. Our algorithm also improves the quality of purview mesh rendering as is evident when compared against the inside out algorithm of Hedman et al. 2016. And most importantly, our algorithm performs at speed which is two to three times faster than deep blending approach. Since NERF and free view synthesis are slower than deep blending, we leave them out for a fair comparison. We are also able to render at interactive frame rates on a high-end gaming laptop. Here is a quick screen capture from a Dell Alienware laptop on our Ponch dataset. In summary, our contributions help improve the trade-off between speed and rendering quality of free view image-based rendering algorithms. While we consider only classical methods for our hybrid algorithm, we envision an extension of the idea to neural rendering works once they are sufficiently fast solutions. Thank you for listening to my talk and I'll be happy to take your questions. Hello everyone, I'm Yi Hongdong from Nami Lab School of Software, Tongji University. Today, I'd like to report to you on efficient algorithms for rotation averaging problems. Beginning, let's review the rotation averaging problem. The objective of the problem is to determine the absolute camera rotation given a bunch of 
relative rotation estimates between pairs of poses. The problem has vast applications in computer vision, robotics, sensor networks, and related areas. An example is shown in Figure 1. The mathematical problem of the rotation average problem is computing the absolute rotation matrices given the relative rotation matrices between cameras. As involving a graph of cameras, each camera is represented as a vertex of the graph, while each undirected edge ij represents a relative rotation moment rij. The goal is to find absolute rotation matrix ri for every vertex i such that ri rij is equal to rj holds. In practice, due to the noise in measurement of relative rotations, one can only achieve Ri Rij is approximately equal to Rj. The problem is considered to be troublesome because the rotation constraints on the rotation matrix are highly non-convex. The set of rotations about the origin in three-dimensional Euclidean space is referred to as a special orthogonal group denoted as SO3 given by Formula 1. Using the upper definition, the rotation average problem can be simply stated as follows. Given the estimated relative rotations Rij, we want to recover the and absolute rotations Ri from the pairwise relation Ri Rij is approximately equal to Rj from some Ij. Generally, the relative rotations are obtained with estimation error. To take the estimation error into consideration, the rotation average problem is usually formulated as follows. In this paper, we restrict our attention to the commonly used caudal distance. Problem 3 is non-convex and extremely difficult to solve due to non-convex constraints as O3. The so, work Ericsson et al. 2018 provided a sufficient optimal condition for problem 3, which we summarize in theorem 1 with definition R tilde. We present two fast and accurate approaches for computing the absolute rotation matrices by defining the relative rotation measurement matrix Rij. We first use block coordinate descent method BCD to calculate the Ri iteratively. Since BCD can only be executed serially on different coordinates, to further speed up the computation of absolute rotation matrices, we develop a successive upper bound minimization sum based algorithm. The sum based algorithm can run in parallel on eyes. Both of these algorithms are guaranteed to converge to stationary points, and by numerical checking the global optimal condition. BCD is an optimization method that successively minimizes along block coordinate directions to find uh, the minimal of a function. It is observed that the SO3 strings of problem 3 are separable across the rotation matrices. Hence, the BCD method naturally applies to the rotation average problem. To develop an efficient BCD-based rotation average algorithm, we further simplify the rotation average problem 3. Since the matrices Ri, Rij, and Rj are all orthogonal, problem 3 can be equivalently simplified as follow. It is observed that if we only optimize the i's rotation matrix Ri, the objective function is linear in Ri. In the BCD method applied to 8, while fixing other proxies, the L subproblem with respect to RL is given by formula 9. Define 
a l as follow. Then the problem nine can be equivalently rewritten as follows. The core of the BCD-based rotation averaging algorithm is solving problem 11, which we refer to as the problem of linear optimization with single SO3 constraint, named the loss of for short end. To simplify the notation, we have rewritten the loss of problem as follows. For a three-dimensional matrix X belongs to SO3, it has a parametric expression that is axis angle representation as follow. Hence, problem 12 can be converted to an optimization problem with respect to u and theta as a formula 13. It can be seen that if a is diagonal, then the problem becomes much easier. Therefore, let us firstly simplify the loss of problem 12 and explore the solution structure, which is stated in the following lemma. With the above lemma, we only need to determine sigma hat by solving formula 17. Since d hat is a diagonal matrix, problem 17 can be simplified as Formula 18. The optimal solution to problem 18 can be derived in closed form as follows. According to the fact of SVD, all the diagonal elements of D are non negative. As a result, we have either case 1 and case 2. For case 1, we can easily obtain the optimal solution as follows. In K2, it is readily seen that minimizing the objective of 18 is equivalent to minimizing the following formula. In conclusion, for K2, we can obtain the optimal solution to problem 18 as follows. Therefore, for both cases, we can write sigma hat in a unified form as follows. According to the above results, we have the following key theorem. Based on theorem 1, we give the procedure for solving the loss of problem in algorithm 1, which is frequently called in both BCD-based and sum-based rotation averaging algorithms. Furthermore, we present the BCD-based rotation average algorithm in algorithm 2. Clearly, the BCD-based rotation average algorithm runs in serial. However, for large-scale rotation averaging problems, parallel algorithms are more desirable. Hence, by further exploring the structure of the rotation average problem, we propose a parallel rotation average algorithm. Our parallel algorithm is based on sum method. At each iteration, the sum updates the variable by successively minimization in either local tight up bound or strictly convex local approximates of the objective function. Under mild conditions, the sum algorithm is guaranteed to achieve convergence towards stationary solutions. To proceed, let us define R is equal to the concatenation of R1 to Rn then we can recast problem 8 as follows. The key to sum is finding a locally tight upper bound for the objective of problem 20. To this end, we find a locally tight upper bound in the following lemma. Lemma 2 shows that a 
quadratic function of r can be upper bounded by a linear function of r. Using such a locally tied upper bound, we solve in each step of the sum method the following problem. Note that the objective of the above problem is linear in r, and thus is separable across ri. Therefore, by writing ar bar as formula 23, we can decompose problem 22 into n independent loss of problems, which can be easily solved using algorithm 1. The sum-based rotation average algorithm is summarized in algorithm 3. The above two algorithms require feasible initialization. In general, a good initialization is desirable because it could speed up the convergence. To this end, we propose a cross-form optimal solution to the noisy case below, which can serve as a good feasible initialization for the proposed two algorithms in the noisy case. Let us describe the rotation average problems as an N vertex connected graph G named RA graph, where each vertex in V represents an absolute rotation and each edge IJ belongs to E corresponds to a relative rotation RIJ if it exists. For a connected graph, there must exist a shortest path link each pair of vertices. Resorting to the concept of shortest path, we formula present in lemma 3, a cross-form optimal solution to the noisy case, which is a good feasible point for the two proposed rotation average algorithms above. We use complete graphs to construct Synthetic data in this part, we randomly generate a set of absolute rotation ri to form a complete graph. Each relative rotation is computed in the presence of noise. The noise are random rotations obtained by an axis uniformly simple from the unite spheres and an angle generated from the normal distribution with mean zero and Various file. In addition, the parameter p is used to control the sparsity of the generated graphs, meaning that only p percent of relative rotations are used in rotation average. In the simulations, we set phi to be 0.2 or 0.5 and p to be 0 or 0.3 in our four sets of experiments. In Table 1, we compare our methods with BCDSR. The solution of our algorithm 2 and algorithm 3 have lower errors and running times, which also satisfies the optimal condition. Converges slowly and suffers from plateau often. Compared to BCDSR, our algorithms converge fast. Besides, they can be accelerated with proposed initialization. Actions are all obtained from public datasets. We use image to generate the relative rotations RIJ via SIFT. Table 2 lists the computational results and the average time required by the two algorithms. It is observed that the proposed sum algorithm outperforms the BGDSR in both computational time and error on all datasets. In addition, we use an open source code bundler and the sum-based algorithm to run some reconstruction examples. The results are shown as follows. Thanks for your attention. Hello, I'm Tsukasa Fukusato from the University of Tokyo. This talk introduces our work 
titled Interactive Missing or User Defined It Point Set. First, I would like to explain a background of our research. Tracing is a popular way to make a 3D model in the production. In this method, user first set 2D images, for example, front and side views on a 3D space, and then press 3D point and face while referring the images. These processes are divided into the two work, paint designer's work and 3D modeler's work. The main reason is that each step requires special skill. For example, in case of paint designer's work, imagine the final characters and drawing them on a paper. And in case of 3D modeler's work, 3D modeling operations. In general, such specializations allow for increases in the productive capacity of work. But we think there are some problems in the character design. For example, when the final character quality is insufficient for the final film, we do not know where lay the causes. Paint designer's fault? 3D modeler's fault? No. In many cases, we think that one of the causes is that it is difficult to pass a character concept from paint designers to 3D modelers. That is, a difficulty in communicating between them. Therefore, I think that instead of specialization work, it is necessary to support the solo work. Then, we again investigate the 3D modeling process and existing researches. The previous work replaced the 3D modeling step from the manual work to automatic system, for example, image-based system. I will skip the detail. But image-based systems are not robust and not easy to generate high-quality 3D model. This is because there are a wide variety of designer drawing, pencil, oil painting, colored image, the photo. So it is difficult to extract efficient image features from images. Therefore, we refocus on the paint designer's work. Of course, Paint designers don't have 3D modeling knowledge, but we think if it is possible to add some annotation on images, this is possible to lower the bar of 3D modeling method. Against this background, we implemented a simple tools to manually design 3D points from 2D images. Instead of 3D space operation, the system allows user to mark 2D point on 2D image. Based on this point, the system automatically estimates their 3D position and mesh data. Of course, this manual pointing on 2D images is a technologically a trivial problem. But even user with no 3D modeling skill can easily scan and generate 3D point set one by one. However, there are some problems in these approaches. This is that even if 3D vertices are designed manually, a fully automatic meshing is difficult. In addition, fully manual meshing, such as connecting all 3D points, might be very tedious. So, as an extension of our work, this research goal is to make 3D meshes from the manual 3D points. At first, we investigate existing point-to-mesh method. As you know, implicit approaches compute a scalar indicator function in the 3D space, and they can robustly create the smooth surface that approximate noisy data well. We first try to apply implicit method to the our manual point data. However, their results have some artifact like this. In addition, a common problem is that the resulting surface does not pass exactly through all the input points. In our case, all the their points have been carefully placed, so the resulting surface is expected to pass through the all the points. So 
This is undesirable for a user-defined point set. Next, we also investigate explicit approaches which connect the given point directory. These method advantage are that it is easy to preserve all the surface detail. We also try to apply them to the manual designed point data. However, their results also have some artifact like this. We think the advantage of explicit method is probably right, but the quality is not enough. Therefore, instead of who automatic mesh generations, we consider an interactive method to design 3D mesh from point data. Then, we focus on interactive method. Alpha shape system is a popular way to extract triangle mesh from the drone triangulation of the input point using a simple slider manipulation. However, this uses a constant global alpha value like a global threshold. This means that it is difficult to control local details. In other words, if we can assign the spatially varying alpha value to the triangle face, this is possible to control local details. Therefore, based on the such simple idea, we investigate interaction method. A painting metaphor is a standard approach to produce a significantly better result than a fully automatic method, such as a mesh simplification and segmentation. So we think a painting metaphor can be used in our program setting, and we simply combine alpha shape method and paint interaction. This is main idea. Of course, I know the main idea is too simple, but very useful for manual missing support. We demonstrate our interface. In this time, we use a human head point set data. This is a design panel. This is an interface panel. And this is an alpha value slider. Our system generates a tetrahedral mesh using a drone triangulation as a pre processing. Next, the user change the global alpha value. The system sets a value to the, all the unpainted triangle and extract the alpha shape mesh. From the extracted mesh, the user then selects the painting operation such as a brush tool and a fill tool and click on the triangle on the screen. The system paints the selected triangles in red. The painting operation fixes the alpha value of the painting triangles so that they will not be affected by the subsequent change of the global alpha value. By repeating the above process until all the prepared triangles are painted, the user obtains the desired 3D mesh with a special varying alpha. This is a video demonstration. OK, next, we show several examples of our meshing result. This is an example of cartoon young girl and middle age characters. This is a meshing result. This is a textured result. This is another example of rough sketch character and female characters. This is a meshing result. And this is a textured result. In addition, we compare the result of the existing method with our method. With a traditional method, such as a board pivoting method, extracting the triangle model involves the complicated parameter tuning process based on the trial and error. That is, this method is not suitable for the interactive use. 
The standard alpha shape method allows the user to design 3D model simply by changing the global alpha value. But this does not preserve the local shape. On the other hand, by using our system, natural looking meshes can still be obtained, and the process is very fast. It only took one minute to obtain this result. We further performed the user study with a five participant. All participants had experience with designing 2D or 3D models using a commercial software. The main reason is to gather feedback on the advantage and the limitation of the proposed method 2 from the participant. This is score result of the user study. All scores are more than 4. The participants feel our system is useful. In addition, I showed a free comment about a proposed system. Overall, the participant reported that the proposed method is straightforward to use and useful. On the other hand, there were some requests from participants. For example, they want to add several support functions, but I think that those are not to be serious problem, and it is possible to further improve user experience with an engineering effort. Lastly, I explain some limitations and future work. First, the mesh connectivity is automatically computed via donate triangulation without any constraint. So, it might be better to allow user to triangle point set with each constraint by combining the conventional meshing process if necessary. Second, it may be interesting to explore the possibility of extending it to the include another 3D modeling process. For example, point data sampling, the mesh repairing, and seamless texture mapping in the future. This is a conclusion. In this research, we focus on the 3D modeling process and extend alpha shape system to add a painting metaphor. That's all. Thank you for listening. Hi everyone, thank you for attending my presentation. I'm Sylvain Rousseau and I'm going to present the GCGT paper we did in collaboration with Tammy Woobaker named Unorganized Unique Vector Quantization. In this presentation, I will explain the data and related work used uh, during our researches. Then I will explain the core of our contribution, Uniquant, a method to compress sets of unorganized unique vectors. I will show some results, including an application scenario, and I will finish by concluding and giving some perspectives on our work. Unique vectors are used to describe the direction and are used in many fields. In computer graphics, they can describe the direction of batch of rays in Monte Carlo rendering or the local surface orientation of acquired 3D point clouds. State-of-the-art methods to compress single unique vectors are the quantization methods. Unique vectors are vectors of length 1. The set of those vectors can be represented with the surface of the unit sphere. Thus, a unit vector can also be represented as its representative point on the surface of the unit sphere. This is the representation I will often use in the remainder of this presentation. Quantization method defines a point set on the surface of the unit sphere. This point set, that we call quantization point set, should have a distribution as uniform as possible for the best precision. Unit vectors to be compressed are projected onto the closest point of those quantization point sets. There are hundreds of existing methods. The most precise is the spherical Fibonacci point uh, set quantization. However, this method is computationally inexpensive and doesn't scale to high resolution. Octahedral quantization have a better precision speed ratio. I'm now going to present our contribution, Uniquant, our method to compress and organize unit vector sets taking advantage in the fact that we don't handle single data. First, I'm going to give you the general idea, then I will explain each step. In our context, we work on set of unorganized unit vectors. 
Unorganized means that the order in which the data are is not important. Since this order doesn't matter, we are able to claim some spatial currency in the data that we will later use by reordering the vectors. The spatial currency is the thing that will help us improving the precision of the quantization. This reordering spatially group the vectors over the surface of the unit sphere. We are then able to work by group or batch of unique vectors. However, it's hard, if not impossible, to create a quantization point set specifically for an arbitrary subpart of the unit sphere surface. While those point sets have been researched for decades and decades and have good properties in terms of both speed and precision. The core idea of our method is to introduce a mathematical function that map the quantization point set from the surface of the whole unit sphere to the surface of small groups. This mapping keeps all the good properties of the quantization point set, mainly their uniform distribution, and is really fast in terms of computational speed. In practice, the mapping is not bon done from the quantization point sets on the surface of the whole unit sphere to the surface of our small group, we inverse map the points, aka the unit vectors, from the surface of the groups to the surface of the whole unit sphere, where they can be compressed with an improved precision compared to classical quantization method using, using any uh, quantization method uh, you want. Now that uh, the grouping, uh, now the, the grouping step can be done in several ways. The studied, uh, we studied three of them. The first one is the discretized spherical coordinate. It is the fastest one. However, as you can see on the picture on the left, the generated groups have irregular areas and their shape are either spherical triangles or spherical rectangles. In the mapping step, we have to approximate the groups uh, using a spherical cap and uh, we are looking for groups that, uh, for grouping that gives groups with both uniform areas and sharp shapes that are closed from spherical caps. The second method that we studied is the closest spherical Fibonacci points. This method is way more computationally intensive but gives groups with quasi-equal areas and with shapes that are way closer from spherical caps, as you can see. Since this second method is computationally intensive, we also studied a pre-computed version using a lookup table. Now that we have groups of unit vectors, we need a way to describe them mathematically, to describe their bands, uh, to be able to map them. And to do so, we approximate the surface of the groups where is their bending spherical caps. We are then able to apply a mapping from the surface of those spherical caps to the surface of the whole unit sphere. This mapping was designed to keep the uniformity of the distribution of the points from the quantization point set, meaning that a quantization point set with a uniform distribution on the surface of the whole unit sphere will be mapped to another point set with a uniform distribution over the, the surface of uh, the, small, uh, the small spherical caps. To respect this property, the main idea is to respect the following equality. We want the map uh, to map an infinitesimal ring from the surface of spherical cap to the surface of the whole unit sphere by sliding, sliding it along the P0 axis being the main axis of the spherical cap. The equality to respect is that the area of the infinitesimal ring over the area of uh, the spherical cap should be equal to the area of the mapped infinitesimal ring over the area, the surface of the whole unit sphere. I will not have uh, the time to explain uh, all the detail of the map. But at the end, you will end up with the following formula. The interesting part about this formula is uh, the fact that you only have one parameter, k, 
that can be competed with a simple algorithm that depend on your grouping strategy. But uh, to give you uh, the insight, k is equal to the projection of the spherical cap on its central axis p0 over the projection of the whole unit sphere over this axis uh, being the diameter of uh, the unit sphere 2. Interestingly, uh, to realize, um, uh, we, we, you can realize that uh, the inverse mapping can be done uh, using 1 over k instead of k during decompression. And so you can use the same function for mapping in inverse mapping. You will also uh, need to define p1, which is a vector orthogonal to p0, uh, and which is in the same plane as x, x. Uh, x is uh, the unit vector you want to map, uh, and so you will find p1 using a simple cross product. To summarize, the compression algorithm works at, uh, as follows. First, your group, your unique vectors, create some spatial coherency. Then you approximate the shape of each group with uh, spherical caps. You map the unit vectors from the surface of those spherical caps to the surface of the whole unit sphere, where you are able to apply any existing unique vector quantization technique with an improved precision. Now I'm going to show you some results with some artificially generated data as well as some in some application scenario. Here you can see some results on 10 millions of randomly generated unit vectors. You can see that the grouping strategy impacts the efficiency of the method. The grouping is done on 13 bits and the quantization is the octahedral quantization. Using DSC, the discrete spherical coordinates, the fastest method but the less precise one for the grouping step we have a gain of six bits in terms of precision this means that you need six less bits to encode each unit vector using csf the closest spherical fibonacci uh, for the grouping step you have a gain in precision uh, which is way more significant uh, which is around 10 bits per vector if precision over the speed is the most important thing, this grouping strategy will be the best. However, now let's look at the speed of the method. In a network transfer scenario, <clears throat> let's say that you want to transfer 1 gigabyte of data corresponding to 11.2 million of unique vectors over a network using the average connection in France of uh, 3.8 megabytes uh, per second. <coughs> if, you can't, uh, if you want to transfer the raw data, it will take 269 seconds. Using the, 30, uh, using the 32 bits octahedral quantization in combination with our method, uh, so combining uh, grouping, compression, and sending, it will take between 100 and 126 seconds, leading to a gain uh, of up to 2.5 uh, in terms of speed and uh, as you can see in green the grouping and the compression will still be minor uh, in this application scenario compared to the data transfer times. Now um, let's look at an application scenario in the form of the compression of direction of lights, ray, light rays in Monte Carlo rendering. The number corresponds to the structural similarities, uh, the closest one, the better. The first line corresponds to the rendering realized with the octahedral quantization alone. And the second line represents this quantization in combination with our approach. The structural similarities are computed against the rendering realized without any compression at uh, 500 uh, uh, sample per pixel. As you can see on the picture, and with the numbers, our method is able to improve a lot the quality of the result and is able to obtain good quality result even with low bitrate per direction. On the right image, we highlighted in red the pixels that have a difference over 10 2% between our worst case scenario, so the 16 bits. Um, 
and uh, and the, the rendering uh, realized without any compression. The areas where those errors are located are all under the stairs, where the indirect lighting is predominant. In those areas, the light burns several times before finding a light source, and the error accumulates. So it is uh, logical to have uh, uh, more important errors. In the paper, you can find the result, the same result on more scenes, and uh, also in the additional uh, materials uh, using different metrics with uh, PSNR. If you are interested by the subject, uh, you can look at the, the paper. I'm now going to conclude and give you some perspective on our work. In this paper, we introduced a new method to compress on the fly uh, sets of unorganized unique vectors. In the future, it will be interesting to study new application scenarios. We already studied one and introduced an adaptation of Unicant to medical data uh, by adapting Unicant to brain tractograms. Uh, brain tractograms are data that represent the architecture of the human brain, and more specifically, the connectome. This adaptation is able to compress tractograms that weigh tens of gigabytes in a few seconds, dividing their size by 10, with an error way under the precision of the, uh, the MRI uh, that is used to, to acquire them. It will be interesting uh, to study the, to, uh, the, the application of Unicant uh, to other uh, computer graphics data such as SOFL of normal uh, or normal maps. It could also be really interesting to study the um, uh, to, to studying non-uniform distribution uh, either by using some entropy coding or maybe by adapting adapting the mapping uh, to target uh, a given PDF, uh, for example, in the context of distributed Monte Carlo rendering. This will be really, really helpful. For Monte Carlo rendering and distributed Monte Carlo rendering, uh, it will also be really interesting to study uh, the impact of the compression artifact on popular denoising method to determine if they actually impact the final quality of the image in actual movies production. I thank you for your attention, and if you have uh, if you are interested by the subject, you can find the article of the GCGT website, or you can contact me if you have any question, I will be happy to answer them. All right, uh, thanks to everybody for your presentations and, and all your great work uh, in the session. So uh, we have about uh, 20 minutes for questions and um, uh, we can also go into the break. There's a 10 minute break. And of course, um, there's also Discord uh, where conversations can continue there. Uh, so we got one question uh, during the talks uh, from um, Christoph. And um, he asks about um, uh, he asks about the uh, efficient algorithms for rotations um, of Yu Hong. Uh, your formulas for x u of theta, which is the parameterization of the rotation matrices, look like it would simplify if you used unit quaternions instead of axis and angle. And um, he was wondering if you've considered that option of working with quaternions instead of axis angle rotation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, the formula uh, x u and theta does look simplified if we use quaternions unit, but the conclusion is the same because both cases are solving linear programming, and we use uh, axis and angle presentation for two reasons. Uh, the first is the uh, it's uh, it's intuitive. And second, if we use continuous unit and the solution is only, only about X, Y, and Z, uh, not include W, uh, we, we should transform 
um, transform it to to solve solve this problem. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I I have questions uh, in the meantime. Um, so one question I had um, regarding um, uh, face split. Um, so I really really like that work a lot. Um, and I was uh, one one thing I was wondering as I watched your presentation is um, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between your work, which is transferring style to video of a person's face, versus work where a person is um, you know retargeting their performance to, for example, control. Like you could imagine a system like yours being used to drive an animated character. Are the techniques at all similar or related? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, thank you for this question. Um, so um, I, I wouldn't say that the techniques are uh, similar, uh, but uh, I say that uh, uh, our technique or the, the style transfer techniques can be also like, used to animate, animate uh, maybe characters. So uh, at our presentation, uh, at the end, uh, we, um, if, if you remember the, the statue, the, uh, yeah. So it was, it was basically like the, the, platform, the, uh, the actor was driving the statue. So um, if, if this is uh, what, what you mean by, uh, by the retargeting. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, so, so um, we, we demonstrated like a prototype uh, use case that it can be uh, also used to, uh, to stuff like that. And um, yeah, so does it answer your question? Yeah, it did. And I was also impressed with how well the system did on teeth and with open mouth when the mouth was opening yeah. and closing. But it seemed like that it, it somehow um, having it uh, apply style to the hair was challenging. Um, so it seems to work better on the mouth as opposed to the hair. Do you have any intuition about why? Yeah, yeah um, definitely. So um, it's it's mainly because the uh, the face and uh, like the, the inner face is uh, well structured. So uh, we have like uh, exact structure of face. We have eyes, nose, mouth, and um, uh, yeah. So we, we can do some we can do some assumptions. We can do we can detect the landmarks, and by detecting the landmarks, we can drive the uh, drive the style transfer. Uh, whereas for a hair, it's like everyone has different hair, and um, they are not. Um, like this, uh, we would need some 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 kind of um, like uh, leading points or uh, or some kind of segmentation and um, stuff like that to uh, to uh, perform well on hairs. And we of course we tried we tried many things. So we tried um, to have some uh, segmentations and we tried to send like a point around the hair to you know came up with some with some uh, leading points and. Well, yeah, so it, it uh, worked um, somehow, but um, we decided to focus mainly on the on the interface. So yeah, our hairs are definitely challenging. That's great. Um, so yeah, uh, I have questions for everybody here. So um, regarding uh, the free viewpoint work, which was you know also terrific. Um, so uh, I was wondering as well. One thing I was wondering is. Um, a few things. Uh, one, you talked about how, um, computing the uncertainty for your geometric regions, and that's one of the ways that you balance like quality versus um, speed. And could you talk a little bit about how you estimate your confidence or uncertainty for the geometry you're estimating? Right. <clears throat> uh, sure. Uh, so thanks for that. Um, it's essentially. Um, so, so we have uh, multiple kind of uh, approaches to, to rendering, right? Because it's a hybrid algorithm. And um, the thing is that we first have a, a global textured mesh, which we um, estimate using um, uh, multi-view stereo approaches. And then in addition, we have those per view meshes, which uh, are valid for the corresponding input views they, co uh, they, they uh, like depict, but they are usually off when you move away from the input views, right? So it's a kind of a purview geometry. And um, the idea is that um, if uh, the global mesh from MBS, from multi-view stereo, differs too much uh, from all the samples that we get from the purview uh, geometry, then this is a good indicator for at least one of them is wrong. Uh, and probably 
uh, the purview one at least one or a couple of purview meshes are probably preferable when it comes to uh, like the, the rendering quality. So this is kind of like the uh, the basic basic principle, I would say. Yeah. Very cool. Um, and you also talked about um, you know you had this one graph that showed rendering quality versus speed. How did you determine the quality, which is a subjective measure? Right, so this is purely subjective. Uh, so there is no uh, no numerical analysis done for this graph. It's mostly for, for illustrative purposes, but I think it highlights uh, the idea that um, the, the higher the quality you want, the more time you have to spend. And this is uh, not always like the best thing to do, right? Because you want to, you want to be fast and, and uh, beautiful, of course. Uh, but um, the, um, so what I wanted to say, uh, I guess that's what I wanted to say. I forgot something else, but I'll, I'll come back to this. <laughs> well, you mentioned, I think maybe at the end that there were some perceptual metrics that your group also, right. you know, integrates into your work. Um, is that something that, that, you're, that you could talk about? Right, right. That's actually the point that I forgot in the last question. Oh, so yes, wonderful. so perfect. Uh, so we have, um, so we have tried a couple of, um, numerical quality uh, metrics, right? So we've tried things like a PSNR, SSAM, and uh, LPIPS, which is this perceptual deep learning based loss uh, that people tend to use these days. And um, it turns out they all not really reflect the subjective quality of the algorithms uh, that, that we tested, right? So uh, the, the problem really is we, we don't have good quality metrics, for especially not for um, image-based rendering type of art artifacts where we have ghosting and blending and blurring and stretching and these kinds of things, which are uh, yeah, not really well captured by those quality metrics. Um, and this is evident in, in the corresponding table in our um, paper, where we like uh, have essentially marginal differences between the methods, even though if you look at them, for example, in our supplemental material, where you can view them side by side, that uh, the quality, subjective quality is significantly different, at least in parts. So uh, yes, we, we tried this, a short answer is we tried it. Um, it's questionable if they are very expressive in our setting, um, but yeah, uh, that's, that's kind of the idea. Yeah. It's very interesting. Um, we have another question um, about face split um, from uh, uh, Navanil uh, Mukherjee. Uh, so it's a, the, the example images showed pretty good results with the face mask generation. Can you think of any situation where it could have problems? Um, with the face mask, so um, you, you mean that the face mask is uh, is like well generated, or, or what, what this question means? Um, Let's see, could Nevin Neil um, elaborate? Yeah. So like, oh, okay. So I, I will start answering. So um, yeah. So if the question is uh, if the question is uh, where the uh, face mask generation will fail. Uh, so um, in uh, in that case, the, the face mask, uh, we generate face mask using, uh, we, we take the landmark because we generate the landmarks anyway to um, um, drive the synthesis to, to deform the, uh, deform this uh, GPAS. So we have the, we have, uh, we have all the points like around the jaw. So we take these points to define the, uh, the face mask and uh, to get uh, like this complicated IRA, which is complicated because there are hairs. So we, we draw like a line here and then we sample a sample along this line. Uh, we sample the uh, a color component. So we try to determine like what's the, uh, purely based on color, maybe in some different color space than RGB, but it's, it's based on color. So we try to determine like what, what color belongs to skin and what color belongs to hair. And like, of course, in, in this era, it can happen that uh, it can happen that um, the mask is not, uh, not that uh, perfect, not that precise, but uh, it's, um, uh, yeah, so if, if the mask is not that precise, it's usually quite uh, quite okay because uh, so for example the uh, like the the style will not go all the way to the hair or the style will go a little bit to the hair, which is um, sometimes not that big issue. Uh, if you are considering like if, if the style is uh, has similar color uh, as skin tone, uh, these artifacts are not visible at all. If the style is like a bronze tissue, so uh, you, you see that like there's a skin 
Uh, there, there's a glaze that the, the, um, the bronze is not going all the way to the hair. Um, but yeah, we are not, not facing like any uh, major issues with that. It works quite, um, quite robustly. But I'm not sure if this was the question. Yeah, maybe um, maybe if um, if if they'd like to give us a few more detail, we can um, discuss this a little more. And there is also Discord where you can um, continue this discussion after. Yeah. Um, other things. Um, so I had a question about the rotation averaging. Um, a general question: Do you have plans, or is there like an open source implementation of your two optimization algorithms so that we could try using them at home? Uh, uh, I, I will upload it into GitHub. Uh, but the link I, I will uh, I will uh, I will write, write, write in the uh, in account. Sure. I'm uh, curious. Uh, what is it implemented in? What did you What did you do this work? What programming language uh, did you use for your simulation? I, I use Python to to implement. Uh, thank you. Cool, thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, and I and one other question I had is, um, you know, you compared your techniques to Ericsson uh, 2018, and um, I wondered, did you? So you compared this the speed and the iterations. Did you compare the final results? Um, did you look at you know the rotations that the solutions? That were found between your work and Ericsson's work. How similar are they? Oh, yeah, yes, I, I compare it. Uh, uh, the the result is 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 very similar, but uh, but uh, uh, the the uh, major difference is the speed. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, the uh, our, our our method is is much faster than than the the than, than the uh, this. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Well, thank thank you very much. Um. So um, let's see. So the interactive meshing. We didn't get to ask you any questions yet. Also, really great work. And um, everyone here really really liked watching all your presentations. Really well done. <laughs> Um, so, um, my main question for you, uh, Sukasa, is I was wondering uh, about uh, the, um, you know, the dot tracing tool. So, you know, so your work focused on building that mesh once you had the 3D dots, but mm -hmm. how, how, how is that cloud of 3D dots generated from the 2D dots that people are marking on their drawings? Oh, so currently is just using a triangulation algorithm by using uh, on the 2D images. So basically, as so a professional artist, you know, draw the several fixed view of the cartoon character, for example, the frontal and the side and the top and the back. So it so that is a, it is easy to fix the rotation matrix the about the, so the triangulation algorithm. So in other words, is it that the you assume that the planes of each of those drawings are, for yeah. example, in a square, mm -hmm. and then you can use triangulation to say, okay, this point corresponds to the same other point on that other image, so it must be here in 3D space? Yeah, that's true. And um, yeah, because I was wondering, um, did you test, so you tested on the bunny, you tested on human faces, did you try mm -hmm. doing a whole human character? A uh, whole human characters. Uh, Kaiju, so previously, so I have tried to make a, a whole characters, but uh, so it currently, so it is a uh, difficult to make a 3D mesh. This is because uh, so current, uh, current the missing tool is based on the, the traditional, the journey triangulation. So I mean that uh, so maybe uh, so it is necessary to use uh, so another system uh for the uh as a initial missing result or another method yeah yeah 
Yeah, it was great. Um, mm -hmm. And let's see. So last, we have a few more minutes here for questions. Um, yeah. Um, so sorry, I'm just looking through my notes here. Um, Yeah, so for um, Sylvain, for, for um, your wonderful project, Compressing Unorganized Unit Vectors, um, I, I wanted to ask you just a very high level question, which is um, obviously if, if your data is unorganized, it's much harder, but how does, does the problem of compressing these big sets of unit vectors become easier if they are organized in some way? Uh, thank you for the question. Um... In fact, um, well, the, the the fact that they are unorganized um, open the opportunity to to create your uh, own uh, uh, distribution of the uh, on the data. So uh, so I, I think it might even be easier uh, to handle uh, unorganized, even if you have still to uh, add the step to uh, group the data and and so on. Uh, so it's really different uh, topics, uh, in fact, and uh, uh, there was not that much work in uh, in the unorganized uh, in the vector field. So yes, it was a, an interesting project, especially since uh, afterwards it uh, it it uh, had a use on in other field uh, in medical field. So yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was terrific. A really nice presentation. Thank you. So I have one more minute for questions on my timer. Is there any questions people have? Ah, I have one. Um, let's see. For again on um, regarding the unit vector sets, if I want to randomly access any point in the compressed set. What memory reads will I need to perform to get my data? Two fixed size reads without sequential dependency. And this is from Christoph. You will need to, um, uh, well, uh, you, you will need uh, to, uh, to read uh, your vector. Uh, and uh, depending on the, the array you will be on, you will know the, the, the group uh, in which he, he is. Uh, so uh, if you're reading, uh, you, you should need only uh, one uh, fixed, uh, yes, let me think. <laughs> uh, it, should be, it should be only one uh, uh, random access, uh, if I'm correct. All right, I think that ends the session. Um, so um, I think we have break. Uh, we have a ten minute break before our next our next session. So uh, is there anything from the conference organizers that they'd like to say or add that I forgot to mention? <laughs> Please continue. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this final paper sessions of I3D. So we have some really great presentations for you coming up and then uh, Q&A following all on uh, deep learning and machine learning topics. So first of all, we have heteroskin net, a heterogeneous network for skin weights prediction. Uh, and here we have Xiaoyu Pan, who's gonna present that. Uh, next up, we have Efficient hyperparameter optimization for physics-based character animation with uh, Zeshi Yang and Ziki Yin. 
Uh, after that, we're going to have active learning for interactive audio animatronic performance design. Um, and here we have Matt McCrory, Jeremy Stollartz, and Kenny Mitchell. And this is going to be a live presentation only. So uh, this, this uh, presentation won't be recorded. Uh, after that, we have data-driven particle-based liquid simulation with deep learning utilizing sub-pixel convolution. And here we have uh, Virginie Tumanov, who's going to be here for the Q&A. And then finally, we'll have synthesizing indoor scene layouts in complicated architecture using dynamic convolutional networks. And how, here we have uh, Hao Xiang. So uh, remember to post your questions in the Discord and uh, we'll have a Q&A session following these presentations. Hello everyone, my name is Xiao Yupan. I am a PhD student in Zhejiang University. Today, I am going to present our work titled HetroSkinNet, a heterogeneous network for skin weights prediction. This work is done in conjunction with University of Leeds and Tencent Institute of Games. Character rigging is universally needed in animation production. Where animators first create a skeleton and then bind the mesh to it with skin weights. We observed that in a character, different bones influence areas of various sizes to different extents. For example, the spine can influence vertices on the torso which are far from it, while the finger bones only affect nearby parts. We seek an automatic skinning method considering both vertex and bone features. Also, as the character models become more and more complex, there are out-of-body bones and disconnected mesh components. We seek a proper method to deal with them. I will first take you through some related works, and then explain the method, followed by some results, and conclude with some discussion. The most related works of automatic skinning can be roughly classified into geometry-based methods and data-driven methods. Geometry-based methods such as Pinocchio and geodesic voxel binding, which is integrated in Maya, calculate skin weights using handcrafted functions, which makes assumptions for the weight distributions. Thus, it is hard for them to catch anatomic information on the mesh. Data-driven methods catches this information by learning from a set of character models with artist-painted skin weights, such as RigNet, which uses a GNN as a learn function. The above methods consider the skin weights as a function of vertex features, ignoring the difference in the bones. Neural skinning learns different skin weights functions for different bones by assuming a semi-fixed skeleton structure. However, they cannot be applied to non-human models. Another aspect of related works is graph neural networks. There is an increasing interest in applying GNNs on computer graphic tasks, such as mesh CNN and mesh-based autoencoders. Like mesh CNN, our network is a spatial approach and can be applied to meshes with various topologies. Graph heterogeneity is also a hot topic in deep learning. However, few attempts have been made to tackle the heterogeneity. Our work tries to explore this area. Our proposed skinning method provides two key contributions. First, we construct a heterogeneous graph network that automatically estimates skin weights by considering both vertex and bone features. In the network, we use a new graph convolution operator, which handles heterogeneous nodes in the graph. Secondly, we propose a distance named hollow dist 
to quantify vertex bone relations, which can handle ill conditioned situations, including out of body bones and disconnected mesh components. First, we provide an overview of our methodology. Given the input capture model with its mesh graph and skeleton graph, we calculate the hollow disk between each pair of vertex and bone. The distances are then used to link the two graphs and thus forms a heterogeneous graph. Our network then performs convolution operations on this graph, including convolutions inside the subgraphs and convolution between the two subgraphs. And finally, estimate skin weights for each vertex. Next, I will describe the calculation of hollow disk. Hollow disk is a distance modeling vertex bone relationships while considering the mesh shape. We adopt the idea of volumetric geodesic distance. Firstly, we voxelize the mesh surface, which divides the space into mesh cells, which have bold boundaries, bone cells, which are colored white, and hollow cells, which are the rest. We note that since we only voxelize the mesh surface, the bone mesh relationships are not considered. In other words, the distance can be applied to both in-body bones and out-of-body bones. Then, we find the paths from bone cells to mesh cells via broad-first search to compute cell-to-cell -cell distances, as illustrated in the image. The distances are indicated by cells colors. Next, for unreachable mesh cells, which are caused by disconnected mesh components, we restart this search from the boundary of traversed cells. Finally, we calculate the bone to vertex distances based on the calculated cell to cell distances. Using the hollow disk, we are able to create connection between the mesh and skeleton. Formally, given a character model with its mesh and associated skeleton, we build the corresponding graphs. Mesh graph GM where nodes are mesh vertices and edges are mesh edges. Skeleton graph, GS, is built contradictory to common perceptions, whose nodes represent bones and edges represent joints. Finally, we connect the vertex nodes in the mesh graph with their top k nearest bone nodes in the skeleton graph, according to Holotist. In other words, in our work, we assume that the vertices are only influenced by their top k nearest bones. The attributes are assigned to nodes on the two subgraphs. For a vertex node, its attribute is a concatenation of its position and inverse of its hollow disk to the nearest k bones. And for a bone node, its attribute is simply the concatenation of the positions of its start and end joints. Our heteroskin net operates on the constructed heterogeneous graph. Its structure is illustrated in the image, where intergraph convolution and intragraph convolution operations are performed alternatively. Intragraph convolution operations operate inside the mesh graph or skeleton graph. And intergraph convolution operates between the mesh graph and skeleton graph. The two operations will be explained in detail afterwards. The two graph convolution operations extract local features of every bone and vertex nodes. We also add a global branch for each graph. The extracted local and global features are then concatenated and processed through an MLP to get the resulting skin weights. Intragraph convolution operations aggregates nodes' local features of their homogeneous neighbors. We build this part based on edge conf. The operations on the skeleton graph and mesh graph are slightly different. For a skeleton graph, we simply use edge conf, and for the mesh graph, 
a vertex's receptive field is restricted by the distances to its one ring neighbors, which is affected by the mesh tessellation. To tackle with this, we adopt the operation introduced in RingNet, which perform edge conf within nodes one ring neighbors and geodesic neighbors. A, a node's geodesic neighbors are those whose geodesic distance from the vertex is within a threshold. With the intergraph convolution operation, the vertex nodes and bone nodes aggregate information from each other mutually. Due to the unbalanced property of the two graphs, where the mesh graph contains thousands of nodes, while the skeleton graph have no more than 100 nodes, we design the vertex to bone and bone to vertex operation differently. For bone to vertex convolution, as a vertex is influenced by k bones, we simply concatenate its feature with the k influential bone nodes features, and the resulting feature size is fixed. However, things are different in vertex to bone convolution. Different bone nodes connect to different numbers of vertex nodes. We cannot simply concatenate their features. To keep the resulting feature size fixed, we instead concatenate the statistics, which is maximum, mean, and variance of the influenced vertex nodes. And each convolution operation is followed by an MLP layer for nonlinearity. We have two terms in our loss function. The data fitting term makes the prediction to be close to the ground truth. Instead of L2 norm, we treat the skin weights as label distributions, as it sums to 1 and is always non-negative. We use KL divergence to calculate this term. In animation, we wish the skin weights to distribute smoothly on the mesh. Thus, we add a smoothing term which uses discrete Laplacian matrix of the mesh. To evaluate our proposed method, we train our network on model resource RigNet V1. It contains models covering a wide range of classes, such as humanoid, birds, and fishes. Their meshes and skeleton have totally different topology, and some of them have out-of-body bones and disconnected parts. We present the result of our method. Using our predicted skin weights, we animate different kinds of models by manually generated skeleton motions. The result is quite close to the ground truth. Here, we compare our method with other automatic skinning methods. We first present the qualitative result. On the top row, our method shows lower errors on the end of the dress and pigtails. As our method learns the features of the corresponding bone and applies skin weights functions different from those applied to body bones. On the bottom row, our method shows lower errors on joints. As our method learns the relationships between the bones, which is not done by previous methods. Then, the quantitative result. Our method outperforms the other methods according to all metrics. Next, we demonstrate that our method is robust for out-of-body bones and disconnected components. The out-of-body bones are colored red. We can calculate hollow discs for both inside bones and out-of-body bones. Our distance is also robust for disconnected components.
We do ablation studies to justify the importance of each part in our network. The quantitative result is listed on the top. And we also visualize the result without smoothing term in the loss on the bottom. The smoothing term surely improves the smoothness of the skin weights. In the future, we would like to test our method on more complicated models. As the models in real industry may contain 10,000 of vertices and hundreds of bones, which is not available in our data set. Secondly, we would like to accelerate the calculation of hollow disk, which is the bottleneck of the full procedure. And at last, we would like to explore more features relating the mesh and skeleton, which may improve the network's performance. Finally, we would like to acknowledge the following grants for supporting us in this research. Thank you. Today, I will present our work, Efficient Hyperparameter Optimization for Physics-Based Character Animation. Physics-Based Character Animation has a wide range of applications in our everyday life, such as animated characters in games and robotics. Physics-Based Character Animation has made significant progresses in recent years, from handcrafted controllers like Simicon to sampling-based controllers like Semicon and to recent neural network controllers such as DeepMimic. These neural network controllers are trained by deep reinforcement learning and have been used to produce various realistic motion skills. Although DRL-based character animation systems have shown impressive results, reproducing these systems for a novice student is not easy. There are many hyperparameters in these systems which have a big impact on the learning performance. Hyperparameter tuning for these systems is a non-trivial problem. Manual trial and error requires a tedious amount of work. Automatic hyperparameter tuning algorithms are therefore desirable. We formulate hyperparameter optimization as a black box function optimization problem. Here, x is a hyperparameter and fx evaluates its performance through DRL training. The problem is challenging as fx is a black box function and the, the evaluation of f can be very expensive. Patient optimization is an ideal choice for black box function optimization. It selects a candidate point to evaluate in each iteration and finally returns the largest function value everything. There are two key components in BO, a patient surrogate model and an acquisition function. The surrogate model is used to fit the objective function. The acquisition function measures the, the utility of a given point. At each iteration, we will maximize the, the acquisition function to find the most promising point to be evaluated next. Here, we use a widely used BO algorithm, function process upper confidence bound, namely GPUCB, as an example to illustrate the concepts of BO. The surrogate model used in GPUCB is Gaussian process. The acquisition function has two components, mean, mu x, and the standard deviation sigma x of the objective function, estimated by the GP model. Mu x favors points with large potential values. Sigma x encourages querying informative points with high uncertainties. Beta treats of exploitation and exploration. Here, we use a simple function to illustrate the optimization process of GPUCB. At each iteration, GPUCB selects the next point to evaluate, which maximizes the acquisition function. The GP model is updated to fit the objective function after each iteration. With more and more observations, the GP model predicts the objective function more accurately. After several iterations, GPUCB finds the optimum. Traditional BO assumes we only have access to the objective function. However, in many problems, we have cheap approximations of the objective function. Multi-fidelity vision optimization, MFVO, implies these cheap approximations to further improve the efficiency of BO. Here, we use an example to explain this concept. If we try to find good hyperparameters for a real-world robot system, 
The system's real-world performance is the original objective function, and the low-fidelity approximation is its performance in computer simulation. Computer simulation is fast and can be used to predict real-world performance without building the real robot. In this work, we propose an MFVO framework to find good hyperparameters for DRL-based character animation systems. We first need to design cheap approximations of the objective function. For supervised learning tasks, we can use performance on smaller data set and performance at early training stages as low fidelity approximations. However, these approximations cannot be applied to deep reinforcement learning tasks. Early stages for deep reinforcement learning can be noisy and good hyperparameters do not always guarantee quick convergence. We need to find better cheap approximations for our problem. Curriculum learning is a learning method where task difficulty increases during training. Easier tasks are cheaper to accomplish and can serve as good initializations for more difficult tasks. Curriculum learning has been widely used in character animation. For example, it mimic increases the task length gradually to help the character to learn longer motion skills. Yu et al. 2018 applies hand of God assisting forces to the torso joint and decrease the force gradually during training to encourage the emergence of natural gates. Inspired by curriculum learning, we can use easier motor skill learning tasks at cheap approximations. Easy tasks are faster to learn and can be used to prune better hyperparameters. Control policies learned at easier tasks can be transferred to more difficult tasks to further reduce the computation cost. We show the pipeline of our method. We first construct multiple tasks. Easier tasks are cheaper but less accurate. Our method implores easier tasks to prune bad hyperparameters and shrink the search space to promising regions. Control policies are transferred from easier tasks to more difficult tasks to reduce the computation cost. With the help of cheap approximations, our method can find good hyperparameters fast and efficiently. We describe the multi-fidelity function in details. The original objective function is fx. Our multi-fidelity function is fxz, where x is the input hyperparameter and z parameterizes the task difficulty. Note that fxz max is the original objective function. After constructing the multi-fidelity function, we need to design the actuation function. In experiments, we found that optimal regions of low fidelity functions and original functions overlap well. Based on this key observation, we propose our progressive activation function, PAF. PAF is similar to GPU CB activation function. The difference is that the task difficulty parameter Z is included. PAF can be seen as an approximation of GPU CB activation function at task Z. In each iteration, CMFBO selects the next hyperparameter and the corresponding task by optimizing PAF progressively. We first maximize PAF at Z equals Z mean with multiple start point strategies. Fx Z mean is the lowest fidelity function and alpha X Z mean is the PAF at Z mean. The selected candidate serves as the initial solutions for PAF optimization at more difficult tasks. The search of candidate points on more difficult tasks is conducted on nearby regions of the initial solution. This progressive procedure terminates when z equals z max on the uncertainty as the current task is large. In this way, we shrink the search space and avoid exploring non-optimal regions on expensive tasks. After selecting xt and zt, we evaluate fxt zt. Given xt and zt, we can find an evaluated pair close to xt zt from past observations. The policy trained at either tasks are transferred to the current task. In this way, we can further reduce the computation cost of fxz. The below picture shows the policy transfer process. X axis and Y axis represent hyperparameters and task difficulty respectively. Red stars are evaluated hyperparameters at different difficulty levels. The green arrows represent policy transfer. We conduct two experiments to demonstrate the effectiveness of our method, morphology optimization and hyperparameter optimization for deep mimic. In this experiment, we optimize the, the morphology of simulated characters for learning fast and efficient locomotion skills. The character's morphology has a big impact on the locomotion abilities. 
we will use morphology parameter as hyperparameters of the DRL-based animation system. We compare our method with a single fidelity BO method, GPUCB, an MFBO method, BOCA, and a recent DRL-based method. In this experiment, we optimize the hyperparameters for Deep Mimic. Deep Mimic is a stepping stone for many DRL-based character animation systems. Recent works simply use the default settings of Deep Mimic into their systems with minor modifications. We compare our method with default settings in Deep Mimic, hyperparameters optimized by GPUCB and BOCA. The parameters we try to optimize is shown in the right table. Here we show the results for work task. We plot the learning curve with different hyperparameters. DRL training with our optimized hyperparameters converges much faster than others. The following video demo shows the learned skills at different training iterations. Hyperparameters optimized by our method for one task can generalize to other tasks. Here, we use hyperparameters optimized for work to learn cut view skills. In conclusion, we propose curriculum-based multi-fidelity vision optimization to optimize hyperparameters for DRL-based character animation systems. There is a limitation of this work. The multi-fidelity functions are problem-dependent and are designed manually. In the future work, we will apply our method to high-dimensional and non-Euclidean search space. Applying our method to real-world robot design problems is another interesting direction worth exploring. Thank you for listening. Hello everyone, I'm Evgeny Tumanov, I'm deep learning engineer at NVIDIA, and today I will be presenting our web paper that we have written with my colleagues Dmitry Karopchenko and Natapong Chintanas. The paper is titled Data-Driven Particle-Based Liquid Simulation with Deep Learning Utilizing Subpixel Convolution. My talk is particularly relevant to those of you who are interested in physics approximation and especially in approximation of fluid dynamics. But I did my best to structure my presentation in a way that highlights the concept ideas, which can be reused in many problems within computer graphics. This is the plan of my today's talk. First, I will share the core ideas and motivation of our work. Then, I will explain how these ideas can be applied in the context of fluid simulation. And Finally, I will address the comparison of our work to the alternative methods. So, let's dive in. Our work is based on two main ideas. The first one is getting old today. The idea is that having implemented one solution for some physics problem by solving differential equations or maybe even integral equations, we can go one step further and try to accelerate the solution. We can analyze the solution algorithm find its most 
time consuming part, then clearly understands what the input and output of this part are. And then just learn the approximation of the output given the input. It can be done with deep learning or machine learning. Uh, the only thing really needed uh, is, of course, implementation of the original method in order to produce the data set containing large variety of the inputs and corresponding outputs. The second idea is an idea of upsampling. In image processing, there is a well-known problem of restoring a high-resolution image from its low-resolution version. It's a well-researched problem and its solutions powered with deep convolutional networks can be straightforwardly reused uh, for physics simulation. Having simulation in low resolution, let's say on a small grid, we can train a network which will predict the solution on a larger grid. If a physics problem is defined on a Cartesian grid, then the first two ideas, which can be used separately or in conjunction, provide a ready-to-use data-driven methodology on how to accelerate any grid-based or area physics. But the problem is that not all the algorithms which are, uh, which are used in computer graphics are defined on a Cartesian grid. Some of them are Lagrangian, particle-based. The initial task we had was to research whether these two ideas can be applied to already real-time simulation method called position-based fluid solver, in order to make it even more computationally cheap. Um, we knew that the first idea is surely applicable, uh, because we already had known about decision trees-based uh, approximation proposed in the work by Luber, Ladisky and others called data-driven fluid simulations using regression forests. Besides one more similar work called Lagrangian fluid simulation uh, with uh, continuous convolutions by Benjamin Unhofer and others was published during our research. Uh, this work proposed approximation with uh, continuous convolutional networks uh, which work on the particles level. What we didn't know was whether uh, the second idea could be somehow applied, and if the ordinary or, let's say, grid-based convolutional networks would be fast enough and accurate enough at the same time when applied to PBF approximation. This was the question addressed to our research, and in, in the next part of my talk, I would like to explain the solution we finally found. Position-based fluid algorithm enforces constant density by solving a system of nonlinear constraints, one constraint per particle. Each constraint is a function of particle's position and positions of its neighbors. If you have a look at PBF algorithm, which simulates one step, we will notice that the most time-consuming part of it stands for enforcing incompressibility. Thus, following core idea number one, we need to substitute this part. Let's find out the input and output of these lines. The output is the correction of position for each particle, which linearly affects the velocity update. If we go further and try to analyze what data is processed within the lines 6 to 20, we will notice that this data includes positions of particles and information about obstacles on the scene. Thus, if we want to substitute this part of algorithm with its approximation, then we need to solve following the following regression problem. The regression target is either position correction or velocity correction, which we need to restore given some descriptor S. The descriptor has to comprise information about particles positions and obstacles in the domain. This is the first and very intuitive problem statement for approximation of one step PBF makes. But a few modifications need to be done in order to make this scheme really efficient. The first one is time stepping. PBF becomes more accurate with smaller time step. So we may want to approximate a number of uh, steps PBF makes in order to achieve a faster solution for more accurate version. Effectively, nothing really changes. Let's look at our final scheme. 
We still start with an advection, but we use an alternative formula. The same was used in both works on PBF approximation I mentioned before. After particles advection, we perform collision detection of particles against obstacles. This part in PBF is done during the constraint solving loop. We, in our method, subtract this logic from the neural network part of the computations in order to make the regression problem actually easier. Then we add viscosity estimated on the grid. Uh, the linear coefficient of the viscosity can be learned from the data. It can be set to zero if PBF, uh, which was used for collecting the data set, uh, doesn't have the viscosity. Or it can be even used after, uh, after training the neural network as an artistic control. Having added the viscosity, we ask the neural network to predict uh, the velocity correction, which needs to be done in order to hit each particle's velocity within several sub-steps PBF makes during one step of our algorithm. So now we know the target of our regression problem, and we need to define a proper descriptor which would allow the network to accurately predict the target. As we discussed, this descriptor has to include information about positions of particles and information about obstacles in the domain. Also, as we discussed, uh, this descriptor has to be defined on a Cartesian grid, since we are going to use ordinary or grid-based convolutional networks. We define the descriptor in quite straightforward way. We computed uh, for each cell how many particles occupy that cell. And if the center of a cell is located inside some, uh, inside some obstacle. These two features constitute two channels of the input tensor which comes to the neural network. But this is not enough. Since our target is defined at particles at their locations, our network has to receive an additional input containing uh, the locations where the prediction is required. Please notice that this is quite an unusual problem formulation. We have the input defined on a regular grid and the output is defined at continuous, in continuous space. This is quite an unusual thing in context of deep learning. But at the same time, it seems to be quite a usual thing for, uh, for computer graphics and not only for, for physics. Uh, the first example coming into my mind is, is about clouds rendering. In this problem, uh, volume is often uh, continuously sampled and for each sample, indirect lighting is estimated either with the Monte Carlo method or with its approximation with a neural network. But this is a completely different story. Uh, so let's proceed to the neural network design we used in our work. Our architecture design is the result of long optimization process. All the details can be found in the paper. Here I would like to explain only final two uh, options we, we got. Uh, the first option is referred to as ANN, Accurate Neural Network. It is the most accurate solution we found, uh, which fits real-time requirements 60 frames per second, uh, considering simulation plus uh, screen space rendering implemented in NVIDIA Flex. Uh, and it is on, uh, on some benchmark scene which contains uh, 0.56 million uh, particles. The second option uh, is referred to as FNN, Fast Neural Network. It is the most uh, time efficient solution we found in a grid resolution equal to 1.25 radius. It is the cell size of the grid and radius is the smoothing kernel radius uh, used by the uh, PBF which, which was used for collecting the data set. Both these networks start with a series of convolutional layers, which at some point produce a latent representation of the input. Then the key part of computations happen, the upsampling. We used a 3D version of subpixel convolutional upsampling, which is well known in context of image super resolution. In our case, it is just a series of convolutional layers with the kernel size one by one by one, followed by 
the depth to space operation. The following operation. The depth to space operator takes a vector across channel's dimension of size s cubed multiplied by some constant c and refactors this vector to form s cubed neighboring cells uh, in the output tensor, each containing a vector of size that constant c. The result of upsampling network is the velocity correction and it is defined all on the grid. And the final step the network needs to do is to find the closest cell uh, for each particle and uh, fetch output from it. Here the trilinear interpolation surely can be applied but we didn't find that it really helps in our case since the velocity uh, correction defined on the grid, that, that resolution after upsampling is already quite large. In this visualization, you can see how the subpixel upsampling performs against the same features extraction network followed by a convolutional network which produces the output without any upsampling and with a trilinear interpolation on the top. Okay, it was a brief explanation of our method. And now I would like to move on to the next part of my talk. To comparison with other methods. In our work, we trained a network to approximate a very accurate configuration of PBF, which makes five substeps during one step of our algorithm. Depending on the architecture, the acceleration is limited by 200x factor if we use the FNN. The limit is computed for a best case scenario seen with resting fluid. In our work, you can find a comparison with a with the bare minimum stable configuration of PBF. An end-driven solution and this minimum version of PBF basically have comparable time efficiency. FNN is faster for a large range of the ratio between the number of particles and the volume of the domain. But visually, as you can see, they are very different. That PBF version looks smooth but massively decreases the fluid volume and lacks details. Our solver preserves the same density constraint but it adds some noise. And let me quickly mention the comparison with other data driven techniques. The work on continuous convolutions didn't really focus on the computation efficiency. Their solution seems to be very accurate but unfortunately there is no ready to use implementation of such a network which can run for a particle system of comparable size to the one which can be processed with PBF in real time. The solution proposed in the work on PBF approximation with decision trees seems to be very fast. We did our best to replicate the results on our data. You can find the details in our paper. Uh, we found that decision trees and our neural networks can be at some, at some level of accuracy to be very close from computation time perspective. But the networks can be easily tweaked to get a more accurate solution and with decision trees we just couldn't beat some accuracy level preserving the stability of test simulations. That's all I have to say about the comparison, uh, having my time limits. And this actually brings me to the end of my today's talk. I hope I've managed to give you a brief overview of our idea, our method. Uh, and how it performs in comparison with the others. I hope you enjoyed it and maybe you will find it interesting to reuse somewhere in your work. Hello everyone, in this video I will present our work synthesizing indoor scene layouts in complicated architecture using dynamic convolution networks. My talk will follow this outline. Modeling and synthesis of structured, real, and informative indoor scenes has become a challenging and essential task, especially for computational design, gaming entertainment, VR and AR applications, and robotic navigation training in virtual environments. The goal of our work is to synthesize indoor scenes and generate plausible arrangements of a set of objects. Many current methods of synthesizing indoor scene layouts rely too much on professional designers, which is labor intensive and time consuming. How to generate realistic indoor scene layouts automatically and quickly has attracted a lot of attention of internal design companies and researchers. 
There has been significant research on the indoor scene layout synthesis. Perry works synthesized indoor scene layout mainly focuses on modeling objects' relationships, as well as the occurrence and arrangement of objects within a room. Early work adopted rule-based constraints or optimization of the cost functions based on design principles to model the object-to-object -object relationships. With the availability of the 3D indoor scene dataset, named SunCG, recent works on indoor scene synthesis proposed learning-based methods. This work showed the effectiveness of image-based deep convolutional generative models on indoor scenes generation. Recursive neural networks and graph convolutional networks were also used to capture objects' relationships. Many previous works of indoor layout modeling and synthesis used SunCG. The majority of these top-down view rooms are rectangular-shaped or L-shaped. However, realistic indoor scenes tend to have more complex and diverse architectures, and there has been little focus on synthesizing indoor scenes, especially generating layouts with these complicated architectures. To address this, we built an effective and novel framework to generate plausible indoor scene layouts. The main contributions of our work include First, we propose an intuitive, structured indoor architecture representation to extract geometric and semantic information of realistic and complicated indoor architecture quickly and automatically. To our best knowledge, we are the first to encode complicated indoor architecture to generate novel indoor scenes, not limited to rectangular-shaped or L-shaped architecture. Second, we build an effective and novel framework to synthesize indoor layouts of complicated architecture. Using dynamic convolution networks, the generated layout can jointly consider multi-level features. Third, through comparisons with state-of-the-art methods, our model achieves superior performance, especially in various challenging realistic indoor scenes. This picture shows the overview of our framework. Given an indoor architecture, the implied geometric and semantic information might affect indoor layouts. For example, a sectional sofa usually is placed against a wall whose length is longer than the sofa. The position of windows, which is a potential light source, might also affect indoor layouts. Taking all of these possible effects into account, our method encoded the indoor scene into a specific representation, which is shown in Module 1. Unlike prior works, arrange indoor objects one after another iteratively. We arranged indoor objects using function blocks simultaneously, since people are more accustomed to roughly dividing the room into several blocks based on their activities and indoor architecture, like a reception block, a projection block, and a dining block, as illustrated in this picture. The functional blocks in our work were represented with oriented bounding boxes, OBBs, based on their functionality, human activities, and spatial relations. Each functional block is assumed to be relative to a wall, called anchor-relative wall. We then employ dynamic convolution networks to predict the anchor-relative wall for given functional blocks, which are shown in Module 2. After computing the detailed layout of each function block, which is shown in Module 3, we generated the final indoor layout by replacing each functional block OBB, with a group of 3D shape objects, which is shown in Module 4. We used this network to generate functional block using oriented bounding boxes. To evaluate our methods, we conducted two user studies. In the first study, we used a two alternative first choice method to compare our method with fast and flexible method, which is the start of the art method, for two types of rooms, including living and dining rooms and bedrooms. We generated 2D top-down view images for this user study for each test method. 
Compared with the fast and flexible, our results are preferred for both types of rooms. Comparing with the professionally designed things produced by layout designers, which is the ground truth, unfortunately, our method is not preferred. We suggest that this might be caused by a more accurate location of objects, which is more visually sensitive to humans, especially in 2D top-down view plans. We conduct the second user study to further compare our methods with ground truth. The layouts to be rated using 20 hour 3D synthetic results and the corresponding ground truth for 15 living dining rooms and 5 bedrooms. 10 participants were required to rate these 40 3D indoor layouts with a random order on a scale of 1 to 5. 1 means the least possible and 5 means the most possible. The experimental results show that when we randomly mixed our synthetic indoor scene results with the professionally designed layouts, our synthetic results are visually consistent and highly acceptable for these participants. When we take a close look of our predicted anchor relative worth for ranging the reception blocks and the predicted reception blocks, we found our results are intuitive and practical. In the upper figures, blue arrows indicate the center and orientation of the corresponding anchor relative worth. We know that our method can accurately predict anchor relative worth in quite complicated architectures, which is consistent with the ground truth. In the lower figures, the red arrows are pointing to each of the corresponding anchor relative worlds. The green arrows and the blue arrows indicate the predicted top two segments to arrange blocks. We found that the location and the size of our predicted functional blocks are plausible. We noted that in the cases with incorrect labels caused by manual labeling, our method still can generate robust and reasonable layout results, as shown in three highlighted figures. According to the synthesized indoor layouts and ground truth, we found fast and flexible method fails to generate plausible indoor layouts of complicated architecture, where our synthetic indoor layouts are more plausible and reasonable. More synthesized 2D and 3D indoor layouts can be found in our paper. These are some indoor layouts of living dining rooms. Could you find the two ground truth results? Did you find them? How about the 3D indoor layouts for bedrooms? Could you find the two ground truth results? Did you get it correctly? Based on our experience, it is very difficult to find the ground truth. We found that the significant factors have been taken into account in our synthesized layouts, which is consistent with the intention and ideas of designers. In conclusion, although there are some aspects that could be improved in the future work, our method is preferred than the state-of-the-art method, and our synthesized indoor layout is not distinguishable to the ground truth. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening, and please read our full paper if you are interested in the details of our study. Hi everyone. So I uh, hope you enjoyed those presentations as much as I did. Um, let's start the uh, Q&A session. So first of all, we have um, a few questions from the chat. So Kenny Mitchell is asking about the, uh, the hyperparameter optimization paper. He's asking for hyperparameter tuning with solving, multi -object uh, solving scheme multi-objective optimization. Do you consider or address a condition of competing resources uh, or goals, i.e. a Pareto optimization problem? Um, 
for example, uh, limb self-obstructions, um, or those sorts of things. Thank you for your question. Uh, yes, our method can be applied to the multi objective optimization settings. Uh, for example, in the second experiment, where we try to optimize hyperparameters of the mimic, our objective function is a return performance uh, divided by the computational resources consumed. So this optimization problem can be viewed as a multi-objective uh, uh, optimization problem, and our method still works well. Okay, okay great. Um, we have a, a question for um, active learning for interactive audio animatronic performance design. So Entumanov is asking, um, what's controlling the motor assembly in the scenes you showed? Uh, so in the cases, um, in, the, in, the, in the scenes that we showed, what's controlling the assembly is basically the motor position that's being directly manipulated uh, when we show the plugin. But the intent there would be to have a mapping, right? To have a more standard animation rig uh, with sort of more normal animating controls that then drive the motor positions directly. Cool. So actually in the example you showed with the Navi Priestess, was that a hand animated little clip or was it motion capture of some kind? Yes, that was hand animated. Okay, with, cool. very, yeah. very, very nice uh, animation there. All right. Um, yeah, I have some other questions. So uh, for the Hetaskidnet um, guys, uh, one question I had is, well, in games in particular, lots of meshes have disconnected components or floating bones. And I think the metric you proposed, the hollow disks, is kind of getting some way to dealing with this. But um, maybe there's a sort of fundamental difficulty with using graph-based neural networks because this connectivity information is not always, not always kind of perfectly meaningful. Um, did you guys have any thoughts about that? And and maybe ways you can make the graph kind of more robust? Uh, basically, we use the graph convolution operations. Uh, in our data sets, we found that there are, uh, there, are multiple, um, there are multiple vertices in the same point. Uh, at the same point, they have the uh, different connection conditions. Uh, they belongs to different components, but uh, we mean, uh, but but they are meant to deform in the same uh, th in the same way. In our implementation, we just merge them, and uh, 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 and in our in our network, we predict one uh, skin weights for the uh, for the vertex in that position, and we re. Uh, rescatter the uh, predicted skin, predicted skin weights for the vertices in on, in that position. Yeah. Okay, great. So maybe some simple heuristics like merging <laughs> vertices and these sorts of things can help a lot. You think? Right. And uh, another question here: um, Do you think the training set is actually important? when you train this sort of system or did you find that um, you know you felt the learn system was sufficiently general to work on all different types of characters whether they're sort of cartoony or realistic and they have different density of vertices these sorts of things uh, actually uh, a data set containing characters that are artistic that that are rigged by artists are very hard to <laughs> very hard to acquire. So the only available data set is RigNet V1. But in the in the company, they they may usually have many uh, training characters that are skinned by artists. They can use uh, uh, they can use the skin act a uh, skinned characters in one game for training and use that training data to uh, predict skin weights for new characters in that game. I mean, you can use, uh, 
use one tr uh, one network for one game or uh, for similar characters, that may produce more pre precise or more uh, satisfactory results. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, uh, we have another question. So um, how fast is uh, this type of skinning? So how long does it take to generate the weights, I suppose? Uh, generally, for characters, that uh, are in our data sets, we usually cost uh, uh, half a minute or one, uh, to one minute to produce the skin weight. So uh, the time, uh, <clears throat> uh, the time bottleneck is uh, the computation of whole disk. I believe this process can be uh, can be accelerated if we use some <clears throat> the so some optimizations such as the sparse voxelization or other methods. Uh, yeah. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, great. So uh, I also have some questions for the uh, paper on hyperparameter optimization. So um, what do you guys think about the sort of trade-off between um, just training a system longer with a fixed set of hyperparameters compared to doing the hyperparameter search. Do you think it's always better to do the hyperparameter search, or you know, what what's your sort of feelings here? Uh, actually, I think that that depends on the problem. For example, in the second experiment of the deep learning, we found that before the uh, before the training of before the hyperparameters converges, we have already find uh, better hyperparameters. But for some New systems, I think the best way is still to tune in the system manually and get some uh, common sense of the this, this system and then use all the framework to find a better hyperparameters. Okay, great. So it's sort of a, uh, a step afterwards to really kind of fine tune and get really the best results out of a system. That's sort of how you imagine it being used. Yeah. Okay, cool. And uh, Maybe you could speak a little bit about the uh, intuition behind uh, your search method. So maybe there's an idea in these RL problems that uh, there's lots of sort of bad parameter settings where you can see right away that it's not going to work. You don't need to train it very long. You can see it's going to fail straight away. Um, is this one of the one of the sort of uh, reasons behind uh, your proposed method or is there something else going on? Uh, actually, in our, in, uh, in our implementation, uh, for this kind of bad hyperparameters, we have already determined this, this hyperparameters. Okay. So actually, I think our system is still useful. And uh, in our search, we found that there are many hyperparameters, uh, there are many hyperparameters which works well for the original problem, but not optimal. Our find optimal, our follow up hyperparameters still outperform these hyperparameters. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, great. Um, so uh, maybe another couple of questions for the, um, the animatronic, the work on animatronics. So, uh, is the is the main purpose of this research for iteration on the actual animatronic design, or is it more f as a sort of aimed as a tool for animators to play around with the animatronic without having to wait for the very slow simulator? Uh, it's a little of both. The 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 there's the component that is for the iteration on the design. Um, and then there is sort of the, the learned part, which is more about the interactivity, right? And being able to animate without having to wait for the, uh, the figure to actually be built. Okay, cool. And um, do these sort of animatronics actually express much dynamics? Like, uh, do they have many like, you know, temporal based behaviors or is it really like a fixed pose a fixed setting of the motors produces a fixed pose of the face i guess i'm not quite understanding the question uh so for example if you were to, if you um 
change the motors very fast? Do you get like jiggling of the skin or these sorts of behaviors? Or is it really like, you know, it's kind of uh, completely independent. Whatever you set the motors to, you're going to get a corresponding pose. It doesn't matter what you did before or, or anything like that. Uh, I'd, I'd say that kind of depends on the figure. Um, sometimes we call that sort of secondary or free animation. Um, and certainly there are cases where that's useful, especially, I don't know, it wouldn't be necessarily modeled, right? But you might have like floppy some things, right? That you want to flap around, but that's not, uh, it's not modeled in this case. In this case, these are, these, this, um, I guess in, in, in this particular set, I, that's not the, that's not the goal, I guess. Right. And I guess it's actually easier for the animators to deal with these systems which don't have these uh, different behaviors over time. Okay, cool. Um, great. Maybe uh, some questions for uh, Avengi on the data driven particle based liquid simulation. Um, so here I wanted to ask you what your thoughts were on the idea of basically rasterizing the fluid to try and do the acceleration. So obviously rasterizing the fluid is important if you want to use like a convolutional neural network or something like this, but do you think it could actually be a sort of acceleration step in a more just like doing some Eulerian process on the grid and then converting back? Because it seems to me in your paper, the rasterization overhead is kind of less than I might've expected. Um, so uh, actually, look, maybe uh, I didn't get the question. So can you try to rephrase it? Yes, sorry. So, um, you know, in your paper, you rasterize the fluid onto this grid so that you can perform machine learning. Yeah, so we basically compute just how many particles occupy each cell. Yeah. That, right, that's okay. True. And uh, I think it, it might be possible to do some sort of standard Eulerian simulation after you rasterize certain properties onto the grid. Do you think this could be useful or is it really only a step that is useful for doing the machine learning? part uh so yeah we uh maybe maybe uh you um you're asking if it is possible to substitute this restorization with the uh, like to make it uh an, another part of our uh computational graph you mean so like you want to make a network which uh, would solve like from particles to 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 uh, to, to their uh, corrections. Is this correct or not? Uh, I think that would be that would be interesting. Is that something you thought about? So actually, uh, uh, in, in, so uh, in in our pipeline, uh, that rasterization part works really fast. You know, like a neural network. Uh, uh, inference takes much more time, uh, and uh, yeah, but uh, uh, so and actually, uh, this rasterization uh, is um, so it 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 can be uh, it, it can it, this step can may, may take longer uh if uh so um you know like uh for for a particle system if you don't know the domain uh so if it is completely unbounded so you first need to uh, compute bounding box and yeah th there are some uh details behind behind this step uh it may take longer if you if you if your domain is completely unbounded but in general uh uh so uh, if you know the domain, then so it, it works uh, like speed of light. Uh, if you, if you have experience with Q the code, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, basically neural network uh, inference takes much more. Okay, that makes sense. So um, I guess the main sort of downside of doing this 
a rasterization is, is it in the memory consumption because you may have many cells that are empty or something like that? Uh, basically, yeah, actually, uh, so the main difference between our method and uh, position-based fluid solver is like uh, position-based fluid solver depends on the number of particles, but we, our, uh, as I said, uh, the bottleneck of our pipeline is uh, the neural network inference and thus uh, we are grid-based and uh, only uh, the volume of of our grid uh, affects uh, the performance. So, and yes, uh, if we have very sparse particle system, then yeah, we, uh, yeah, it, 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 uh, it, it makes uh, things much more difficult. <laughs> uh, yeah, but actually in our paper, we, uh, we mentioned uh, some, uh, some uh, some procedure we used uh, for for sparse systems how to actually uh, divide uh, divide the space into uh, uh, cube like blocks and process them individually with our neural network so and actually uh, in case um, um, uh, so if if you are very uh, if like you have a low uh, uh, so if 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 you need uh, save some GPU memory, uh, like you can you can uh, you can divide or you can divide your grid into like smaller pieces, and uh, then uh, your inference will require less less memory. Uh, so yeah. Cool. Okay, great. Actually, we have we have this type of control over our method. Nice. Okay. Um, and so maybe maybe some final questions for uh, Hao Jiang on uh, on synthesizing indoor scene layouts. Um, so often in in video games, this sort of thing is done with some sort of procedural generation methods. Um, what do you think are the sort of pros and cons of using a data-driven approach like this to the scene generation process? Um, <clears throat> you mean uh, the data-driven methods in, uh, in this area? Yeah, so what's, what's the advantage of using uh, machine learning for scene generation? As opposed to other uh, methods. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, in the in in the real um, uh, realistic uh, in the scenes, um, and there are many complex and uh, diverse architectures. So I think, uh, um, um, there are, there will be many and challenges in this area. Okay. And um, in your data set, uh, did you notice if there was much variance based on the, the different designers or the different people who may have constructed the data set? Or did it seem to be fairly consistent in the different placement of objects? Uh, <laughs> you mean... So, uh, in in your data set, which okay. uh, your data your data set, it's created by designers, right? Uh, yes. 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 It's uh, all of them are, are the designed by the professional designers. Okay. And do you think that different designers have a different style in, uh, yeah. in the data they create? Um, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, have some different uh, uh, styles uh, uh, to place and uh, objects and the, the, the furniture style is not different. Okay. Does this different style of placement uh, cause any problems for the neural network? 
Um, I, uh, I think I, I, I don't find <laughs> some, some problems because uh, I think the network can learn the basic uh, uh, feature to place the blocks. Okay, great. Um, all right, then uh, I think that's all the questions we have. Uh, thanks again to. Uh, oh, we have uh, we have one more question. Uh, a question for Evgeny uh, on the benefits of uh, one of the benefits of PBF is to not have to use a background grid uh, to track velocities. At least, would you be able to apply this technique to a method like Flip, and would it still give you the same performance benefits? Yeah, actually, uh, this is, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, actually, uh, data-driven approximation for, for FLIP uh, was already, it is already done, it is already made. So uh, basically, if I'm not mistaken, in uh, maybe four years ago, uh, Google published uh, awesome work on uh, uh, FLIP approximation uh, with the convolutional neural network. Uh, uh, and actually, the, the killing feature of that paper was that uh, they trained their network in unsupervised way, because uh, basically in Flip, uh, you are so, you are basically uh, you you want to make your uh, velocity field uh, divergence free, so uh, their convolutional network uh, produces uh, pressure field, and uh, basically they uh, train that network to minimize uh, the, the divergence and uh, yeah and our idea I mean upsampling idea is definitely applicable, applicable to uh, uh, to flip and actually it, it is uh, it, it is straightforward because you have input on the regular grid and you have output on the, on the regular grid you, you just want to make uh, the velocity field divergence free yeah, so it, it's applicable. Uh, I can't uh, answer uh, like uh, um, so. Would uh, would I get the, the, this? Uh, so if I would get the same uh, performance benefits, because you know, actually, Flip also have uh, it also has lots of parameters inside, and uh, uh, it it may be accurate and. Uh, and can be fast. It can be really fast. Uh, I, I, one of my colleagues uh, is working on uh, very first uh, version of Flip. So, uh, yeah, uh, lots of details here. And uh, uh, so, uh, the answer is really depends on, on on the configuration of Flip you are using. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. So yes, I think that's uh, all the questions. So. Thanks again to uh, to all of our speakers and everyone who put work into those uh, great presentations. And uh, the next session will be the closing ceremony. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, welcome to the awards and closing session for I3D 2021. Each year, I3D gives prizes and awards to the best accepted papers. This year, we have three awards, each of them with a prize that was generally given by our sponsors. In particular, we will be giving away an Oculus Quest 2 donated by Facebook for the best presentation award. Uh, GeForce uh, 3090 RTX donated by NVIDIA for the best student paper award, and an AMD Pro WX GPU for the best poster award. Importantly, notice that, importantly, notice that for prizes and awards, we only consider papers submitted directly to, directly to I3D. That means that TBCG and JCGT papers that were presented in these conferences are considered invited talks and therefore not eligible for awards. All right, without further ado, let's just start with the best paper presentation award, which goes to 
it goes to Nikolai, John, Patrick, and Jacob for the for the paper interactive path tracing and reconstruction of a sparse volumes. Congratulations, Nikolai and co-authors. You will receive an Oculus Quest 2. Now I hand off to my paper's co-chair, Eric Hines, who will be presenting the Best Student Paper Award. Thanks, Dan. Uh, we're also giving an award this year to the Best Student Paper accepted for I3D 2021. Uh, there were 12 papers that were eligible and uh, where the first author was a student. We had a difficult time choosing just one. Honestly, the, the work would not have been presented here at I3D if it wasn't worthwhile. Um, comparing research and rendering to that in animation, virtual reality, simulation, to computer vision, to gaming, to, well, you get the idea. Our final decision is, the paper Stochastic Depth Ambient Occlusion by Yap Vermeer, Leonardo Scandolo, and Elmar Eisenman. Congratulations, Yap and all. Uh, you'll be receiving an NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3090. I'll now hand off to Christoph Peters, the I3D 2021 Posters Chair for the final award. Thanks, Eric. Out of the five posters, three were presented by students. The committee took a vote to select the best student poster presentation among those. As co-author on some of these posters, I was not involved in this process. I want to thank all poster authors again. I really enjoyed chatting with all of you in the poster session, but only one can win. And the winner is Mara Gagyu, together with Morgan McGuire for their poster MMPX Style Preserving Pixel Art Magnification. Congratulations, great work. The prize for this award is an AMD Pro WX GPU, courtesy of our sponsor, AMD. This concludes the awards, and Ulf will give a final wrap up and talk about I3D 2022. Thanks, Christoph. Before we close the conference, we want to thank again a number of people. Then we will take a glance at the next year's I3 committee. And finally, we want to invite you to the gaming event right after this closing. We are approaching the end. We'll try to keep the remaining thanks short, but they're worth saying. First and foremost, to all those who presented their research work at I3D, thanks. You are the existential reason behind this conference and why it has existed for so many years. And we're happy to play a small part by publishing your results. We also wanna thank the session chairs who did a great job leading the Q and A's for all the sessions. Thanks also to our keynote speakers, Peter Pike Sloan, Paul Dietz and Colin Barré-Prisbois who gave us a broader view on uh, the world of interactive uh, 3D techniques. We also want to thank our sponsors. Our lead sponsor and platinum sponsor is Unreal Engine and the people at Epic. We wanna thank you very much for this. And our gold sponsors are Unity, The Forge, Arm, Intel, Facebook, Disney Research, Google, and Huawei. And our silver sponsors are AMD, Activision, and Nvidia. Actually, I want to give an extra thanks to the sponsors. I3 was given us a virtual conference both last year and this year, and we managed to keep the budgets for both these years to virtually zero. So the sponsors have been kind enough to let us roll over the sponsor money to this year, and uh, pretty much all of them also let us uh, keep rolling it over to the next year. The sponsors were under no obligation to do this, so we're very happy that they wanted to continue their support. We also want to give one last round of thanks to the reviewers. You make the papers better and have worked hard to bring out the best of each of them. And finally, Aaron and I want to thank the whole I3D committee for your hard work. It has been an intense three days. We know you have taken the lion's share of all the responsibilities. And I want to raise a particular thanks to our program chairs, Stravko Velinov and Maurizio Vives. They have been behind the scenes all week, all hours. They managed the virtual studio system, directing the speakers, switched microphones, 
muted and unmuted people, manage the live stream into YouTube, including spotlighting speakers at the right moments. And they're also behind all the material that has been broadcast between the sessions, like trailers and information slides. In parallel to all this, they've also orchestrated the Discord channels. That is a multitude of tasks that you guys have performed for us in the background. And I know it's even more complicated than it sounds. I've heard you download uh, updated OBS script patches in the background, things I have no idea what it's all about. You deserve a special thanks for all this hard work. Also, I want to raise an extra thanks to the paper chairs, Eric Haynes and Dan Casas. Your two years in the committee is coming to an end, and that must feel both good and sad at the same time for you. But uh, you will be on the steering committee for the next year, so we haven't completely lost you yet, and, uh, and that's nice. Which brings me to thanking this year's steering committee, which includes Sheldon Andrews, Natasha Tatarchuk, Morgan McGuire, Derek Novrosesarai, Adam Borgtail and Kenny Mitchell. Now we will talk a little bit about I3D 2022. And here comes the exciting reveal of the next year's I3D committee. And we invite all of you who are watching right now, whether you watch live or later, to be part of this committee. We need your support. We're pleased to announce one of our new general co-chairs, Mike Doggett, who is a professor at Lund University in Sweden. Mike was very active in organizing the graphics hardware conferences from year 2000 up until it merged with the Interactive Ray Tracing Symposium and uh, became the High Performance Graphics Conference from 2009 and forward. He was the general chair of graphics hardware many times during this period. We don't know yet who will be Mike Spear, the other general co-chair, Ari Silvenoinen and I, we will move to become papers chair of next year, according to the I3D tradition. The posters chair position is still open. Christoph Peters who has been poster chair this year. He will move on to become the program chair and uh, we might want a second uh, co-chair there as well. Ari Blenkhorn will continue as our publicity chair. We're very happy that we managed to persuade her um, to the next year. We're searching for a volunteer to assist her and be trained to continue in this role in the future. For instance, some motivated PhD student who's willing to continue being part of the I3D community after finishing school. We probably also need a local chair. I think many of us are hoping to be able to have a real life conference next year, possibly with a mix, with a mix of uh, both real life and virtual. We have not decided yet where to host it physically, in uh, which city or which country, or even if it so it will be possible, but uh, for that we need a person to help out with all the local organization like hotel, conference hall, dinner, etc. Next year sponsors. We're very happy that most sponsors decided to roll over the support to the next year. However, there is room for more sponsors. So if you're interested, contact us and we will make sure your company's name will also be shown at I3D. If you want to volunteer for any of the open positions in the 2022 committee, or if you want to recommend someone, or if you're interested in sponsoring and want information about how to do that, then send us an email to general at i3dsymposium.org. And the same goes if you're interested in becoming an IPC member, so uh, being part of the program committee that reviews the submitted papers, send us a note. Now, I would like to hand over the virtual microphone to Mike Doggett, general co-chair of next year, so he can say a few words. Welcome, Michael. Thanks, Ulf. Um, I'm looking forward to working with the committee for next year on I3D 2022. Um, like everyone else, I'm hoping that we can have an in-person conference and also working on a hybrid conference and yeah, working with the steering committee to put it all together. So hopefully we'll all get to see each other again next year. Oh, thanks, Mac. Thanks. It's good to have you on board with us. Uh, I know we'll talk a lot more uh, very soon. So this is the very last slide, really the last slide. We thank you all and hope to see you again next year. And if you're not quite ready to give up just yet, then join us at our final social event. We will play Rocket League and you see, uh, yeah, you saw on that slide how to join and uh, this is our version of After Party. So hope to see you there in a few minutes. And that's all. I hope that uh, the whole committee and everyone is here shows right now. So 
Ah, it's sad to say, but uh, thanks again and bye bye everyone. Hope to see you next year. Yeah, join us at the Rocket League. Yeah. Bye everyone, thanks. Bye. Bye.